Are we live? We are live. Great. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, is Council Member Ku with us? She was. She was. There we go. There is. Great. Um, thank you so much. Let me just get my notes quickly. Um, okay, so it is Monday, September 28th at 5.04 p.m. If the clerk would please call the roll. Council Member Cormack. Here. Vice Mayor Du Bois. Here. Council Member Philseth. Here. Mayor Fine. Here. Council Member Niss. Here. Council Member Ku. Here. Council Member Tanaka. Here. Seven present. Great, thank you. Um, just one quick acknowledgement. Um, I want to acknowledge that today is Yom Kippur. So for those of members of our community observing it, I hope you have a good fast. Today's a day of reflection and hope. Um, we'll probably call a short break around 630. Um, so I personally can go break my fast and uh, get some blood sugar going. Um, sunsets at 655. Okay, uh, with that, we move to our first item, a closed session conference with the city attorney on potential litigation, uh, San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP et al regarding non-resident access to Foothills Preserve. And to the city attorney, I believe we have a update on the title, is that correct? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is Molly Stump, the city attorney. So um, since the time the agenda was published, we were served with a lawsuit. So we now have an official name and case number. And so um, in addition, this is, um, pending or current litigation. Uh, the case is um, GASQ, G-A-S-Q-U-E et al. versus the city of Palo Alto, case number 20CV370681, um, filed in the Superior Court of Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak to this item? There are no members online at this time, Mayor Fine. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to go into closed session on GAF at all versus the city of Palo Alto? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by council member Niss, second by council member Cormack. Let's please uh, vote in name order. Council member Cormack? Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council member Philseth? Yes. Council, I'm a yes. Council member Niss? I'm a yes. Council member Ku? Yes. Council member Tanaka? Yes. That passes unanimously. Council is scheduled to be in closed session from 5 until 6.30. We will try to be out by then. Uh, if necessary, we may continue this closed session until later in the night. Um, I think that's about it. See you what's, all in a few. What's, Mr. The Mayor? On the, what's on the subject on the email for the closed session? Zoom? Any? Um, I believe it was from Nelly this morning. Um, it's at 11, right, no. 1130. Uh, can the, you got it, Tom? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll see you all, all in a few minutes. Thank you.
before uh, the city council has returned from closed session, uh, but we will return to that item at the end of this evening. We now move on to item number two, a study session on an update of Palo Alto's race and equity work and discussion of next steps. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you and your team have a presentation? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, we've got a few slides that we'd like to walk through. I know we want to spend a majority of the time uh, speaking with our uh, independent police auditor. So I'll work through this very quickly. There's actually quite a bit of material here. So happy to come back to it uh, at the conclusion of the discussion um, with the IPA if that suits your interest. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just want to note uh, what we'll cover in progress to date, uh, including a number of elements as shown on this screen. Uh, we'll have a discussion as noted with the Office of Independent Review, our independent police auditor, and then uh, move to your council discussion. Next slide. All right, just to uh, review that the Citywide Diversity and Inclusion Ad Hoc Committee uh, came forward with a proposed uh, mission statement uh, that is stated here and in a large measure will guide the work that we have to come. And what we will present to you this evening will take some steps in that direction, although tonight's um, information is primarily uh, focused on giving you some visualizations of how we could proceed with the work specific to policing. Next slide, please. All right, and again, just a, a quick review on the work that the council has done uh, back all the way to uh, June, working with uh, uh, the council's direction and referrals both to the Human Relations Commission as well as the Arts Commission uh, and a number of follow-up actions that have happened over the course of the summer, uh, including the establishment of four ad hoc committees, uh, each of which they have met and we've just provided the rosters here for public information. Uh, we have uh, made a number of uh, information elements available to the public that have come up through the discussions that the ad hoc committees have had to date. Next slide, please. And then perhaps to provide a bit of a suggestion from staff as to how to organize the work ahead, we've um, used this graphic to describe perhaps the work much of much of the work that has gone on to this point and then a suggestion on how uh, the council's work might proceed recognizing that this is really a long-term effort but also wanting to focus on some immediate actions uh, that could be taken really trying to describe the work to this point uh, in large measure in the categories of community engagement and learning where there has been the community discussions and some of the initial work with the HRC on the eight can't wait principles, uh, as well as the data collection, which again relate to the ad hoc committee's uh, discussion, request for information, data transmittal, and again, uh, this information that has been gathered to this point. Now, uh, we would suggest consideration uh, that does not need to be acted on tonight, but just consideration as we're organizing the work ahead around how to move forward through a, a specific focused area on identifying gaps. Uh, some of the particular areas that have come up in discussion uh, where existing processes uh, could be described and then those gaps um, identified and have some council direction on where you'd like to shore up uh, some of those identified gaps. Next slide, please. Part of the reason that we're suggesting a bit of a shift in the way we look at the work is a recognition of the number of in the fairly complex system of implementation tools uh, through which a variety of actions are taken by the city. And in the course of the discussion over the last several weeks, those range at the highest level from state legislation and the extent to which that in many ways can constrain the city's ability to take steps, whether it be in transparency or around rules. Uh, that um, may not be the prerogative of the individual city. So at its highest level, state legislative advocacy could be required in order to address some of the gaps that the council may identify and has perhaps already identified. Those then leading to items that are under the city's control, such as ordinances, uh, 
council policy and budgetary actions, which again, while being under the council's control and prerogative, also still one step in a multi-level uh, uh, system of defining how and what the city does. Below that, we've got our labor agreements, another key implementing tool. Again, uh, there has been much discussion or some discussion at least in terms of how some of the labor agreement provisions can constrain uh, actions uh, or at least guide actions as the case may be. So this is another uh, key tool to be considered in looking at what might need to be changed going forward. And then further down organizational structures and reporting structures that could be how our departments are organized, what functions, what responsibilities exist under certain each individual department and how that is set up. And then at the very bottom level, these departmental policy and operations uh, guidance, such as the police policy manual. Those are very specific tactical uh, uh, documents, but again, that really flow from uh, various levels of guidance, policy direction, or uh, legislation as the case may be. And important consideration going forward, how ongoing evaluation, data collection, uh, and the like uh, can and should feed into how both the existing systems are structured and changes that can occur both immediately as well as over time. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, part of the, uh, the shift or perhaps the, the slight shift that staff is suggesting is that we start focusing discussions in specific areas of practice, what we're calling, uh, again, uh, policing practices and citywide practices that reflect the workflow, how the work actually happens or how issues are addressed. And we've got a number of them here identified just as a preliminary list. And then after this slide, I'll ask uh, Chantal Cotton Gaines, our assistant to the city manager, uh, to describe a few examples of how this, um, this approach uh, could help your work going forward with staff uh, taking the follow-up to actually write up, document how these uh, practices currently are structured. And again, in order to facilitate the identification of gaps and will follow up if needed. And they range uh, from policing practices such as that uh, data collection on public contacts, uh, contacts, excuse me, and analysis of statistics and trends uh, on what those tell us to the moving down all the way at the bottom with citywide practices, given that uh, Chantel will speak a little more about uh, some of the policing practices, but then on the citywide hiring and promotions, which include the police department, but are also part of a citywide system on our hiring practices and uh, policies including, uh, should the council be interested in proceed, uh, including as a part of that discussion, how boards and commission appointments are made. All right, so with that, next slide, please. Let me ask uh, Chantal to speak briefly about a couple of examples. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, mayor and council, members of the public. Just briefly, uh, as Ed mentioned that we wanted to illustrate how staff could continue to work with the ad hocs to further flesh out some of these practice ideas. Uh, the two that are highlighted are the two samples I will very briefly go through today, which are public contact data collection and trend analysis, also known as stop data for many, and number three, which is officer conduct investigations and transparency. Next slide, please. So one quick note is there have been a few updates made on this slide even since the presentation went out last week, which shows the iterating nature of this where we are really trying to capture the discussions that we're hearing from the ad hoc, um, the ad hocs themselves. So as Mr. Shikata mentioned, we have the statutory context for each of these and then thinking of the gaps that the ad hoc committees and others have identified. So in the template here, which we would try to apply to each of the practice areas, if this is generally capturing where the um, ad hocs and the council are willing to go on this conversation, then we will begin to go deeper into the areas of concern that we have heard and some of the suggestions. So briefly on this one, in policing area number one, public contact data collection and trend analysis, looking at the potential areas of concern to address based off what we've heard is department focused activities and priorities, really thinking about where is patrol time spent and on what type of activities and if the council had recommendations there and then also thinking about do officer contacts disproportionately affect people of color 
And does increased contact lead to additional use of force? Those are some of the questions we've heard. And with those as the questions, some of the ideas for council to consider to address some of those issues could be things like providing policy direction on the prioritization of types of enforcement activity or resourcing to ensure data is available and accurate related to staff and software. Um, thinking about the information that's available on the open data portal, of course, with personally identifiable information redacted. And lastly, accelerating the collection of data demographics and pursuing statistical research with outside bodies and thinking about the frequency uh, for that type of work. Next slide, please. And then in policing area number three, which you will have the opportunity to really think through a little bit more today as a whole group beyond just some of the work that the Transparency and Accountability Ad Hoc Group has been doing is related to officer conduct, investigations and transparency. So potential areas of concern that we've heard through the ad hoc work thus far is thinking about the current use of force reporting and the IPA review. Uh, right now it's limited to complaints and taser use. And then also thinking about uh, the second bullet point there is what other options for transparency might there be and when does the public get the recordings um, and other case information. So if those are issues that the ad hocs want to continue to pursue, some options to consider can be an expanded role for the district attorney, attorney general, IPA or others related to case investigative case review. Also thinking about the parameters for disclosure um, that upon conclusion of an administrative interview materials being released as opposed to through the whole process. And lastly, thinking about an expanded IPA reporting to be on all use of force cases involving great bodily injury um, versus the current complaint based system. Next slide please. So as I mentioned, that is a template that we are looking to work with ad hocs to flesh all of the uh, practice areas out more to work on summarizing the things that we've heard as well as new ideas generated. So with that, I want to turn it over to our independent police auditors, uh, Mr. Michael Janako and Stephen Conley. Their bios are quickly on this slide and then um, Mr. Shikata can wrap up after they complete their presentation. So Mr. Janako. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Gaines. Um, I'm having trouble starting my video because my host has stopped it. So I think I'm now getting permission to be on camera. So it's great to see you all. I'm glad you all have a chance to see me, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with you this evening. I have with me my colleague, Steve Connolly, who's been working on this assignment for half a dozen years now, and um, he'll be joining me in this discussion. And, and I um, certainly have some opening thoughts uh, to provide, but obviously um, this is a workshop and study session for you all. So if you have any questions that um, come along the way, um, please uh, feel free to stop me and, and ask me anything that, that you might uh, want to. Uh, we had the opportunity a week or so ago to appear before one of your ad hocs, the ad hoc on police accountability and transparency. And so it's good to see council members Phil, Seth and Du Bois again and um, appreciated that conversation. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll just start by talking about uh, our work with Palo Alto and, and sort of the historical uh, way in which we got um, involved with the city. Um, and then go from there. Um, I got to know Palo Alto when I went to law school at Stanford in the 80s, so I do have a long history with your area. We started our work though as independent police auditors in 2008 as a result of some interest at the time by your council at that time uh, to have independent oversight uh, for the city uh, over the police department. And um, in 2008, even though it was only 12 years ago, um, it was really quite novel to have any kind of independent oversight uh, for any police agency in California or elsewhere. Um, there were a handful of other uh, police departments that did have a, a level of oversight like Berkeley and I think Oakland, but they were really a very small handful. And so when Palo Alto um, decided to um, provide us the opportunity to be your independent police auditor. 
I am, I believe you, we were the first auditor in the South Bay other than the city of San Jose and, um, and continue to be, I think, the only independent police auditor for any of the cities in your county other than the city of San Jose. And um, just recently we were um, assigned a monitoring responsibility for Santa Clara County. So as of this year, we are also the monitor for Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and have just started that assignment. But going back to Palo Alto, um, as, I, as I indicated, we started in 2008. Uh, our primary responsibility then, and it continues to be, is to uh, review all complaints that come into the, into the city uh, that turn into investigations by the Palo Alto Police Department. So when a complaint is, ma is made, um, we sometimes have some initial contact with a complainant, um, but the investigation is done by the police department. And then when the investigation is completed, it is then forwarded to our office for review, and, which we do. Um, <clears throat> and that then leads to some interaction with the police department and eventually a, a public report. There are a number of steps along the way um, before we issue the public report and present it to the city manager and then uh, 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 for release to you all and your general public. We do have discussions along the way with the police department. We answer any, we have questions that are then answered. We share a confidential draft with the police chief and his leadership and receive any uh, feedback from them to make sure we are factually on the same page. Uh, we listen to any suggestions they have with regard to our initial findings. <clears throat> Another piece of our process is to also provide a draft to the police association for the police department, receive any feedback from them and then our final step is to have a legal review with your city attorney's office. And at that point, um, uh, the report is eventually presented to the city manager and released. That is the system that we have had in place for a dozen years now. So every two times a year, we issue a report, a public report that sets out our findings uh, with regard to essentially evaluating how the police department did with regard to a thoroughness of its investigation, the objectivity of its investigation, and whether its disposition, that is its findings, are based on evidence and a principle. Um, and to the degree that uh, we agree with the result, we, re we re also report that. If we have disagreements along any of those lines, uh, we are free and have commented uh, in our public reports about areas in which we think the department could improve. And those go everywhere from recommendations to providing additional guidance and policy to officers, recommendations on training, recommendations with regard to the way in which an investigation is conducted and the like. And um, uh, we are um, pleased that we have been able to do this along the way. We have received over the course of the 12 years we've been doing this work, special assignments from council uh, for example, <clears throat> when we first got started, there was an interest by the police department and others to outfit the police uh, department with tasers. And so um, there was some, uh, certainly a, a spectrum of opinions by the community about whether tasers uh, uh, should be authorized by the city for use by the police department. And as a result of that spectrum of opinions, the city determined and decided to have and convene an ad hoc committee on this whole question of whether taser should be implemented by uh, the police department. And in our role as an auditor, I was asked to chair the ad hoc committee that consisted of a number of officials, a number of Palo Alto city families, community members and the like. I was, um, chair of the committee, but I was a non-voting chair. Uh, the committee eventually voted um, to provide, um, to 
<clears throat> to recommend to council that it authorize the use of tasers by its police department. Uh, but it had certain caveats that council accepted. One of those was to have a very robust policy that was to be reviewed by us as the independent police auditor. Another condition uh, was to have a very significant training regimen, which also was to be reviewed by us as the independent police auditor. And then the lasting recommendation that was also accepted and we continue to do is that in our role of independent police auditor, we are to review every time a taser is used by a police officer in the city of Palo Alto and publicly report on whether we think the use of the taser was an appropriate use of force and any other comments we had we have about the use of force. So that is why when you look at our reports, you will always see um, a section of our report devoted to our review of tas any tasers that had been used during that previous six month period. Um, there have been other reports that we have been asked to do um, as a result of some perceived to be unfortunate comments by the leadership of the police department at the time uh, that eventually led in the, in the retirement of that um, police chief. We were asked to look at uh, some responses in, that were intended to heal the community, to provide additional training to police officers on implicit bias. And we did monitor all of those outgrowth efforts as independent police auditor when they occurred and did a public report of what we found uh, as a result of that. The final special assignment we received was there was a controversy about a criminal investigation conducted by your police department of the then director of the Children's Theater. And we ended up <clears throat> reviewing that investigation, uh, making some comments and publicly reporting on uh, what we felt to be some of the issues surrounding that investigation and some of the problems with that investigation quite candidly and issued a public report um, that probably was the one that has received the most attention over the course of our 12 years because of the nature of that investigation and did report out our findings. So that is in a nutshell, um, the kind of work we have done over the, over the past 12 years. Um, Steve, do you have anything else to say at this point on this? Because I'm going to switch topics and then hand it over to council for any questions. Excuse me, I just wanted to say hello and, and make sure my microphone is working uh, just in case I need it at some point. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name is Steve Connolly and I have been a colleague of Mike Janakos for 20 years now. And for the last several of them have been involved with the project in Palo Alto. I would just add a couple quick things to uh, what Mike has already shared. One is that I, I do a lot of the direct interaction with the department. Um, during the course of the, the individual cases or when complaint, complainants contact us. And I do want to say um, that, that we have a um, appreciation for the uh, openness and receptivity and responsiveness of the department. We don't always agree, that is for sure. And, and that comes out at times in, in our reports, but in terms of the, the professionalism and the, the willingness to talk and have a, a constructive dialogue, we are very appreciative of the, the department's leadership and have had a good experience in this regard. The only other thing I would say is that as, as I told you, I've been in this business, if you will, for a long time. And, and I think Mike and I both agree that this is an extraordinary period uh, for the country and for law enforcement and for a lot of jurisdictions like yours reevaluating things. And so we are appreciative of, of the efforts that you're making. As Mike said, we enjoyed our opportunity to sit with the ad hoc committee uh, two or three weeks ago, and we are happy to be of whatever assistance we can be tonight in the future. So thank you. I did want to transition to one final piece um, that um, consists of my opening comments. And, and that is, um, as Steve indicates, um, and, and even more recently since, since the George Floyd tragic murder, um, our phones have been blowing up. And um, there are, are many, many cities in your area and elsewhere that are looking for some level of oversight, some level of additional community engagement, 
in some level of trying to reimagine, reinvent their police agencies. And um, while I, I appreciate the effort that you all are, are devoting to uh, the cause as well, uh, you at least have had uh, for a dozen years um, a, a modicum of police oversight doesn't mean that uh, we all can improve and do more and do better, but I think that's a testament to some for, foresight on behalf of your predecessors at council and, and at city leadership. Um, we also uh, have been for quite a period of time independent police auditors for a number of other agencies in California and elsewhere, including cities of Anaheim, Burbank, uh, Santa Cruz, Davis, and as I indicated, Santa Clara County, as well as others. Um, and, and so that uh, experience in other jurisdictions, um, I'll just say that every jurisdiction in which we are, the IPA, IPA is different and our scope of work is different. Um, so um, in other agencies, either on an ongoing basis or on a, or an, on a, a basis in which we come in every once in a while and do audits. Uh, we do a number of other things that we do not do currently under our current scope of work for Palo Alto. One area in which we spend a whole lot more time in other jurisdictions has to do our, with our review of uses of force. And so in most jurisdictions, our use of force review is broader than our current use of force review in Palo Alto. Um, we will either do a sampling of, of minor uses of force over the course of our auditing period, or we will take a look at certain classes of uses of force uh, for other jurisdictions that we do not do for the city of Palo Alto. So in Palo Alto, the only uses of force that we look at are when three things happen, either it's an officer involved shooting and fortunately, you only had one of those over the 12 years that we've been doing this work for you all. Or a taser uh, use of force, which I explained why we do that. Or a use of force in which uh, the person upon which, you, which force has been used makes a formal complaint, which then results in investigation. So those are the three scenarios in which we look at uses of force. But that cuts out a large swath of force that is used by the police department that we never see. So for example, when a canine is deployed and bites an individual, we won't look at that and don't look at that unless the person complains. If in fact um, a baton is used on an individual, we will not see that unless there's a complaint. Pepper spray, takedowns, control holds, holds um, any of those uh, less lethal force, 40 millimeters, all of that force is something that we would not see in, as part of our ordinary responsibilities, again, unless a complaint is filed. Um, the other thing that um, we don't look at are, again, we are looking at the Palo Alto Police Department through a very small but important lens, and that's the lens of complaints. But as a result of that sort of small focus, we do not look at larger elements that I believe this body is looking at as part of uh, the continued discussion with your community, uh, but things that we do for other agencies, but do not do for Palo Alto. So, uh, you know, we have done, for example, audits of other agencies, hiring practices. We have done audits of how good their background investigations are for new employees. We've taken an audit and looked at recruitment processes for other departments. We have looked at promotion processes and how that works or doesn't work for other departments. We've looked at the employee evaluation process of other departments. We've looked at claims and lawsuits uh, that have been filed with an eye towards risk management for other departments. And we have looked at uh, internal complaints uh, that employees have lodged against other employees and, an inv and any investigation that results uh, from them. Again, that is another area that we do not do for Palo Alto, but we do for all the other agencies for which we are independent police auditors. So um, that's all to say that, um, that you know, as independent police auditors, 
Uh, we are, in my view, doing important work for your city, and we hope to continue to do that for the indefinite future. Um, but as you all reimagine um, how you might want to improve or have more community engagement or oversight in your police functions, um, we um, are happy to uh, continue that conversation from our perspective and history and experience in this field. And I think um, this might be a good time to transition over and see if uh, any members of council have any questions for us. Thank you, Mr. Janaka, Mr. Connolly. Uh, thank you for your service and to the city and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, before I go to council members, um, let's please go to members of the public who may wish to speak on this item. And if the clerk would help uh, those folks provide their comments. Any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your telephone. Our first speaker is Winter Dellenbach. Winter, you may need to unmute. There you go. You have two minutes. I am so delighted that uh, we're doing this tonight. The first ever study session after 12 years with the IPA um, I'm uh, welcome, uh, Mike Janako, and also Stephen Connolly. Uh, thank you, Council Members Du Bois, Phil Sith, and Koo, for working to make this happen, and to all the Council Members also to uh, 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 approve this and have it happen tonight. I am so delighted. Um, as we have heard, the IPA has is a tremendous resource. He's underutilized here in Palo Alto. We need to step up our game if we really want to make progress with uh, uh, reform in our uh, police department. Um, I know that uh, 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 good policing really uh, could use it and uh, our good police officers really want it and we should really do this. I noticed that during the slideshow, it came to the slide where it says um, I talked about um, uh, uh, city ordinances and policies, labor agreements, Palo Alto Police Department policies. All of these things have potential for the IPA to have input, to be reviewing policies, recommending policies, all of that sort of stuff. And he just uh, went through a whole litany of things that he does for other, uh, the, do for other departments. And we should really... Uh, consider this and also returning him to his traditional role from the very moment he started with Palo Alto of handling internal complaints within the department, officer to officer. The very first report he ever filed with the city included uh, two cases of officer, uh, of internal officer complaints. And to think that in December, we took away that function of sexual harassment and race complaints put it in the dark cave of HR is not what we should be about when we are thinking of reform, transparency, and more accountability. And we should return that to the traditional function of the IPA. Thank you so much for doing this tonight and welcome Stephen and Mike to uh, a study session in Palo Alto. Thank you, Winter. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand or dial star nine. Our next speaker is Aram James. Aram, you have two minutes. Okay, thanks. Hey, Mike, uh, when the um, IP originally started, you used to fly down to Palo Alto and I would personally interview complainants with you up in the attorney, uh, city attorney's office. Uh, do you do that anymore? I thought it was very effective because it gave folks who had complaints against the police department an, an opportunity to file their complaints with you directly and not have to suffer the indignities they might perceive if they had to go internally with the police department for internal affairs to have, that, uh, have those reviews. Secondly, as you know, I was the one person that was allowed to speak against tasers at the T taser task force back in March of 2007. And even though it was nine to two by the, uh, the taser task force in support of tasers, it came down to just one lone vote. It was Doris Cordell's fifth vote out of nine at that time when the councils that uh, brought tasers to the city of Palo Alto. 
there's been a substantial body of evidence that suggests that tasers are much more dangerous than we originally thought back in 2007, 2008. And I'd like to know your view about taking a, a, a new look at tasers and whether they're uh, so, so dangerous that we don't need to have them in the city of Palo Alto. And as you know, uh, Axum, who now, instead of Taser International, now it's called Axum, uh, ha has a seven page set of warnings. Back in the day in 2008, it was about a paragraph. And now it looks like tasers are so very dangerous that, um, and they've, they've insulated themselves, the, the manufacturer from lawsuits, that now it's the municipalities that are being sued when tasers are inappropriately used to the tune from the Re Re uh, Reuters report, a uh, uh, seven or eight part series very well done that suggests there's about 195 million uh, about 195 million dollars in se uh, in settlements from lawsuits and actual litigation uh do you think it's time to take a review of tasers uh i'd appreciate your response on that mike and i'd like to know about bringing complainants directly to you again thank you Aaron. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on this, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. Mayor Fine, there's no other hands raised. Thank you. And thank you to both of our speakers. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I was gonna kind of, you know, relay the discussion we had and the transparency ad hoc. <clears throat> so, you know, thanks again to Steve and Mike for being here tonight. I think Mike actually covered a lot of it, and I thought maybe I'd just emphasize the parts that resonated with me. So again, uh, thinking about the scope of what falls under their purview, you know, it may be something that we want to consider additional uses of force. Um, you know, canines, that was something that was interesting that we hadn't discussed. Um, in the past, they did used to come and present the audits to council. Um, and they also used to work with the HRC. And again, obviously um, it costs us money to hire these guys, <laughs> but you know, they can, we should again, consider the scope of work. And again, I think maybe having them come with the audit reports is a way for council to stay more in touch with police force and police policies, which I think, you know, we've realized this summer that a lot of us really hadn't had a lot of detailed exposure. Um, we also talked a bit in the transparency ad hoc about the timing for getting audit reports. And there was some discussion that we should or could think about time boxing the different stages so that we get reports in a more timely manner. You know, some of them have taken quite a long time to reach council. Um, so that's something, again, the transparency ad hoc, I think was interested in. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the question about employee complaints and how we had changed that. And I actually had some questions for Mike and Steve so when we talked about that before, um, you guys had had said that um, those those employee complaints were things that maybe you were doing for other jurisdictions. Um, you know, looking at the reports on your website, I didn't see a lot of those. So it doesn't seem like you guys are getting all the, um, you know, employee complaints. So could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is is all the work you do on your website, or do some cities restrict you from publishing some things and you know, how, how much of that kind of work do you guys do? Yeah, um, depending on the size of the city, um, sometimes we will not review every internal investigation, but only a sample of them. So the larger jurisdictions like the city of Anaheim and the city of Burbank, we will take a, a, a slice, uh, random, slice, relatively random slice of investigations and, and report on them. But in cities your size, whether that's Davis or you all or Santa Cruz, we look at, we, we look at all uh, investigations. Um, and if it's employee on employee, we, we will look at that. Or we will look at uh, investigations that are, are, are even sent out to uh, private investigators. Um, well, we've done that in Palo Alto, where sometimes they will send out cases to private investigators uh, to sort of reduce the workflow in-house. Right. So, um, But that's not necessarily like every, I mean, HR complaint that exists in that department, is it? Like, is there some yeah. trigger? 
So for, for again, for smaller jurisdictions, every HR complaint um, that results in investigation is something that we would look at and audit and report out, um, assuming that it hits the tripwire for our investigation. So we're not precluded at all from reporting out. For example, in Burbank, there was a very prominent HR investigation that we just reported on uh, in our most recent report. Uh, for the city of Westminster, they had a very um, unfortunate judgment against them, resulting in a $2 million verdict. And they asked us to pull that case apart. And that all involved officers suing the city based on some HR concerns. And we did a whole separate report on that, on that fact, on that case, and tried to provide a number of recommendations for improvement. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, I, just, I don't know, some of my colleagues might wanna follow up on that. I think the other thing that was interesting uh, was this idea of maybe a performance audit and maybe something like once a year, we schedule an audit into a police process separate from use of force and complaints. And um, I, you know, I found that idea very interesting as well. So, you know, maybe maybe one year it's promotions, maybe another year it's, you know, some other process. And I think that would also help keep the council connected to the police force. Um, I guess my other question for you guys is, are, are we your longest client at this point? Or one <laughs> of your longest? <laughs> Well, I think you might be one of our longest clients, um, if not the longest. We have had, um, I think you might be, yeah, we, you were. Maybe Anaheim. You, pardon me, and Anaheim, right? I, I think, yeah, Anaheim was 2007, so we're very close. They to beat us by one year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Koo. It's very nice to meet you both, Mr. Ganako and Mr. Connolly. Um, so I, I'm going to jump around. Um, when I was, when you were doing the presentation, um, Ed and Chantal, there was the mission statement that you had in here, and um, while I like it. I was wondering if we might have a little bit more of, um, I mean, what are the basis for the? How are you going to? make this mission statement come to fruition. Um, so, so what is the foundation that you're using to make this mission statement come to fruition? Um, if you can kind of give me a little bit understanding of that. Sure, thank you, um, Council Member. Really, uh, this was a product, and I think I may have mentioned it, uh, from the diversity, citywide diversity and inclusion ad hoc committee, and um, really sets kind of a, an aspirational expectation for what the product of our work will be. So at this point, I think we're really at the step of building the work plan or the, the work, you know, quite frankly, this is um, uh, in and of itself, uh, systemic change we're talking about within the city. So putting together the steps that will allow us to um, really make that mission statement uh, ring true. So we're just at the beginning steps of that. Okay, so I wanted to suggest, I was watching the uh, county's uh, meeting on um, equity uh, and race. Uh, I think it was on August the 25th. And they actually went through a series of um, implementing an equity framework that they're working from and it's called the government alliance on race and equity framework and so i was wondering if that might be something to start with you know because it doesn't just we have to focus on the police and you know i mean we have a good police force and a good police department there's a lot of good police persons but i also think that you know in addition to police reform if we're going to look at systemic issues we have to look at citywide right which you have in this in, in in your presentation but to have that framework kind of describe and why why do it on your own you know when there is one out there it's just knowing whether that's the one to work on or not um so if if you have any uh comments about that yes as a matter of fact um 
the Government Alliance for on Race and Equity, uh, also known as GARE. Uh, we've actually now become a member of GARE. So the city of Palo Alto is a member of that alliance. Uh, and we have been looking at how best to operationalize the principles that they espouse, um, while also, uh, to your point, determining whether that's the right framework for us. And, and again, tonight's discussion, as well as the next steps, uh, will help us define that and exactly what those steps would be. Um, so if that's the case, would it be uh, something that the other council members should kind of be brought up to um, up to knowing what GARE is all about and what are the frameworks? So at least we can look at if that's where we want to go with with this large body of work. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, and there, there are many, many pieces to it, uh, as you point out. Uh, so absolutely, if, if the council feedback is that going down that track is the right track, then staff would be happy to follow up and put together more meat on the bone, so to speak. Okay, because I think Gare also looks at the budget process, budgeting as well as the po policy decisions, because budget obviously has, has some uh, play in uh, addressing race, um, systemic racism and so forth. So, okay, I mean, I hope that that's something that we can kind of look at so we have more of a, a, a framework that we we can touch and and it's, it's nice to have the mission statement, but it's kind of fuzzy, you know, it looks really nice and sounds really good, but I don't know where it goes from there. Um, um, then also at the county meeting that I was listening to, um, Mr. Ganako was also um, a key speaker over there where he had um, analyzed and gave the pr presentation on how um, eight can't wait and how it works with the county policies at this point in terms of their sheriff's department. And I was wondering, um, are we far along that maybe that might be something that we would like Mr. Ganako and Mr. Connolly to look at? Um, just looking at our our manuals or even if our eight can't wait policies kind of um i mean our manual policies match what the eight can't wait um is espousing yes uh, just as a point of clarification i think the um, last council action on the eight can't wait principles was yeah. a referral to staff and staff is following up on finalizing the policy manual changes that will result in that action so that that is definitely um, a piece of the, the puzzle so to speak working forward and i think the question um is, as was posed on audits and the like is really just a question of priority and how best to approach um, those next steps, uh, whether it's uh, audits on certain uh, procedures within the department or any other specific area the council wants us to focus on next steps. So five minutes. Okay, just finish up. Does, does um, OIR also audit the, um, do they also do audits of the union contract? Do you Correct. guys do that? Mr. Janaka would like to respond to that question. Um, we, ha we have been involved uh, at times in looking at union contracts to see to what degree they may be impediments to police reform and accountability. We have okay. been asked to do that. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back for my second time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cormack. Thank you, Mayor Fine. Um, I have to admit I'm confused. We have a study session tonight on race and equity work, and that's what I was mostly prepared for. And then at the back of the slides, it's not in the staff report, then we have this wonderful presentation from the um, independent police auditor, which, which, which there are two very big topics sort of related, but which of them are we supposed to be addressing? I, one of my colleagues has done one and one the other. So perhaps you or the city manager could help. Oh take a crack at it then maybe add. I, I think it's probably most helpful to us to uh, focus our questions on Mr. Janako and Connolly, given that their time is here with us today. Um, as the city manager and I have spoken, um, we are looking towards a kind of wrap up of some of the ad hocs in our meeting next month as we have, have these monthly, um, where we begin to, I won't say wind them down, but really focus and distill them out to the community and to our council members. Um, 
but I would encourage us tonight to focus on the IPA, um, though, of course, council member, um, the floor is yours and go with it as, as you see fit. Thank you. Um, I just want to be sure because it's possible members of the public may not even realize that they were coming to speak this evening. Um, it's not really clear in the staff report or the title. Okay. Um, so my questions with respect to the independent police auditor, um, I actually want to start by seeing if it's appropriate um, to speak with uh, the city manager and or the police chief about how the recommendations are implemented. So for example, we received a report in June and I'm curious if those recommendations have been implemented. See, I believe our police chief is with us. I do want to make one clarification. And uh, Mr. Janako, I think for understandable reasons, indicated that the, his reports are presented to the city manager and then to the council. Actually, that's not our process. It goes uh, once reviewed, as was noted, with the city attorney's office, police department, and with the bargaining unit that, that then goes to the city clerk for distribution to the council. It is not, uh, our office does not have a, uh, we'll call it approval role in the in the process. Chief, you want to speak to the recommendations? I think you're on mute, Chief Johnson. So frustrating trying to hit these buttons. Uh, good evening. Yes, as far as the reviews, when we get them back from uh, the independent auditor, we almost immediately, if we haven't already, implement the reviews or the recommendations whether it's policy or um, a protocol, a lot of the times that's something that's worked out even before it becomes finalized. So the answer 99% of the time is yes. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, the other thing that's um, in, in reviewing that report and thinking about the work about the independent police auditor, um, can someone remind me in the public what happened with school resource officers? One of them is referenced in, in this report. I recall them being eliminated in the budget, but possibly the school district was going to pay for them. Where, where did we end up on that? I'm not confident that everyone's aware of it. And I know yeah, I'm not. I'll go ahead with that question. That, that's a contract that was uh, terminated by the school board. The school board voted on not to uh, continue with that contract. So that was discontinued. Okay, great. Um, and then I guess sticking at least for this round, perhaps, <laughs> um, with um, Mr. Janako and Mr. Connolly. Um, one thing that might be helpful if we move forward with this, thinking about um, a change in the scope of your role, would be starting with an understanding of the process that is used in other cities and also the just the scope. So you, while you went over it verbally tonight, I think there'd be an opportunity for a table of some kind that would just help us orient ourselves um, in terms of um, what, what people provide. Um, I'll just give a specific example. I know the vice mayor was giving a few, um, uh, but and certainly Mr. Janako covered this, but um, I know that we have a, a, a less lethal weapon um, that is utilized and it's not the taser. And so that might be an example of something that um, we would want to see if it um, is utilized. So I would, I would be interested in a better understanding of um, a compare and contrast, as it were. Um, and uh, I'll stop there on this topic. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Ness. So, I might be where Council Member Cormack is, which is kind of looking at these two issues. So let me kind of put both of them together for a minute and see whether or not this is something that can be answered. What we're talking about tonight, primarily with a report for the IPA, is something very straightforward. Complaints are filed, you look at them, they go to Bob, Bob takes a look at them, says they've pretty much been taken care of by the time that they get to him and to that level. So at that point, what is our role? You're reporting to us, but where is there any action item in this for us? Or isn't there any? I'm not sure who that question was directed to, but I'd be happy to respond. <laughs> Whomever wants to answer it. 
Well, I think um, just in terms of uh, the the report that the council receives, to your point, council member, it is an informational report. It is not presented to the council uh, for you to take action on because it is, it, quite frankly, simply, I mean, simply is not the right term, but it is reporting out on what's happened. And both the, what the department has done in terms of, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a complaint resulting from a use of force. The department has reviewed that use of force and made some determination as to its appropriateness or not. Then the IPA has reviewed the department's work to determine the department's, uh, the appropriateness of the department's handling of that case. And then that is reported to the council. So again, it's, it's purely informational uh, and uh, should it result in, or should the council want it to result in additional policy direction? That's actually a step that's not currently right. on regularly. So my, my point being that it's passive. It is something we receive. If it's concerning to us, we would either put a memo together or something like that in order to, to get your attention. So there's a different aspect of this though, which deals more with the race and equity issue that we thought we might be discussing tonight, which is where is there an active role for the council members to, to play in this. And I, I thought tonight, it's been a long time since I've gone on a ride along, but times in the past, I almost always went on ride alongs or had more interaction with the police than I currently do. And maybe some of the rest of you have that um, relationship, but for us to really have that visceral understanding of what goes on, I think, we need to have more of a hands-on approach, but that really isn't our job. Our job is to do just what we're talking about tonight. But I'd like to think of some ways, Bob, are you still there in the background? Bob Johnson, have you got, you're back. So, um, and I think you understand what I'm, what I'm, where I'm going with this because you and I have talked about this before. So, are there other ways, I don't want us to be interfering, but I do want us to know what our police force is doing in our community. No, I think your point is, I definitely hear it. Um, and one of the things I, I'd like to remind all the council members is that, you know, for me, this is why I came to Palo Alto a few years ago was because of the, the expectations you have of your police department. I actually welcomed coming into an organization that held such a high standard. And as Mike had mentioned, this was one of the first cities to take on an IPA. That's extremely rare for an agency of this size or a city of this size. But what it does is make us better. So your action and the action of your predecessors made this organization a better organization for this community. It held us to a higher standard. And I do agree with Mike and Steve that there's room for improvement. I've felt that way from the day I came in. I'm extremely, extremely impressed with the quality of work that uh, this department does reviewing their use of force. But I think we can do even a better job. And I think that your role is to make sure we're doing just that, that we're adequately reviewing our uses of force, that we're reporting out on them, and that we're holding people accountable uh, for their actions. So. I'm very willing to do what you wish of us to make this a better organization. Uh, I look forward to working with the independent auditor moving forward. It's something that this organization embraces. And as Steve even mentioned, we're open to criticism and open dialogue because that's what makes us better. So, so um, I'm, going to, I'm going to suggest this for me only, but my colleagues might be interested in that. I recall that in the past, you and I might have met once a month or maybe once every other month, but also um, if, if it's appropriate for you and the others to reach out to us for ride-alongs or something like that, I think that would, um, I think that would be helpful and also very instructive. Yeah, and I do know that many of your colleagues over the last few months have done just that. And so depending on the ad hoc that they were involved with. So thank good, you to all. Good, for your good. Because I think that makes a big difference in the ad hoc um, understanding that we would have. And yes, Monique, I see you down there. 
Thank okay, you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Liz. I've got a couple quick questions, but first a quick anecdote. I was actually at Johnson Park this afternoon and I saw some officers from East Palo Alto and Palo Alto doing something in the park searching and I went and said hello. And I think that's always a nice thing and I hope they appreciate yeah. it. And nice. then when I tell them I'm on the city council, I'm not sure they believe me, but <laughs> um, tell them we appreciate the hard work. Um, I, I just have a couple quick comments. So uh, agree with my colleague, the vice mayor, about maybe more regular check-ins and maybe um, making them thematic. You know, maybe it's a rotating issue year to year or every six months. I think that's helpful. Um, one thing we haven't touched on precisely is like, what would expanded accountability look like? I know some cities have citizen oversight committees. Um, sometimes they have the internal auditors reporting out publicly. Um, what, what's kind of that spectrum that we could be looking at here in Palo Alto? And then um, like play a little devil's advocate with that too. Is, is there a point where we expand accountability so much that it gets diffused and it's not very helpful? And I, I guess that's a little bit to the chief, Mr. Janako, Mr. Connolly. Um, Mayor Fine, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, I think that um, over the over the years and and again in, in different cities there are different levels of connectivity and so for example in the city of davis there's a police accountability commission in um in anaheim we have the police review board um and and in your city uh there was a time uh, when we first got started that we were regularly reporting to your human relations commission um and um, that could again you know, be resurrected if there was interest. Um, I do also think the um, regular reporting we did when we first got started to council, uh, as council member Du Bois suggested, provided at least every six months an opportunity for you all to engage with police practices and, and what we had found over that previous six months. And I think that check-in, uh, whether it's with a commission or directly to council uh, is, uh, and can be a helpful component. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I just would like to add that, you know, right now, and we've had these conversations in the various ad hocs, there's so many different moving parts to the police reform equation that uh, I'm hoping that it's well thought out because I do think accountability and transparency are going to occur um, in greater detail as we move forward. But as you know, that just as the city manager mentioned, so many things are happening at the state level and even the local level with the uh, district attorney's office wanting to take an expanded role that we don't have too many agencies doing reviews because I do think then it can get watered down. I'm hoping that it's very well thought out and coordinated and that we have all aspects of the police department being looked at by the appropriate agencies, so. Okay. And I would just add from my perspective, and as Mike said, we work with a couple of cities that have a, a hybrid model where we're doing a lot of the, the direct substantive reviews, but there is formal engagement by residents and kind of a structure for it that just uh, without taking away the department's own ability and responsibility for, for addressing its own issues and sort of having ownership of that, there is more of a formal mechanism for engagement and for feedback from the community that I think could be a, 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 happy, a nice happy medium. Okay. Thank you all, that, that, that's helpful. Um, Council Member Tanaka. I just have a really quick question. Uh, so I don't know if um, city managers, oh yeah, there we go. Um, so question for you, um, you know, I, was, I talked a little bit about the Stanford Open Data Project and you mentioned that you found one that um, we could participate in. Can you give a quick update as to where we're on that? And because I think in order to really know like what's good or not, we need to know, we need to get some baselines and being part of the Stanford Open Data Project, I think would be really helpful. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, I think actually the project, uh, and in fact, Chantel uh, Scott and Gaines may want to expand on this, but I'll take a, a high level version of it, that the, the initial big data project that you had mentioned, 
I believe is actually concluded. And this is a project that Stanford had undertaken with a number of large police agencies. There is a follow-up or, or at least another project that Stanford is working on that we have been, and our police department has been in conversation in participating in. Um, I don't know that that's actually kicked off yet, but it is, we are in discussions with Stanford on our participation, both with that, as well as other research work uh, that is ongoing. That said, um, we are also, as um, many of the council members know, um, in the middle or at, at a stage in implementing the additional data collection, demographic data collection uh, that's required by uh, change in state law and uh, that that work is also proceeding. Chantel, anything you wanna add? Uh, yes, uh, that's a good summary. And I think the only piece that I'll add is the um, organization at Stanford that focuses on applied research is something else that we have been having discussions with, um, and that is called Stanford Spark. And they are really focused not just on looking at do you have data and the summary of that data, but really thinking about pragmatic recommendations that will help our department um, to advance in different policy ways. So we are also in conversation with them. Each arm of Stanford, as you could imagine, is looking at this from a different angle. And we are trying to be most pragmatic uh, with something that's very useful for us in Palo Alto. Hey guys, thank you. I really appreciate you guys moving on this. Thanks, Council Member Tanaka. Any other questions from my colleagues? Council Member Cormack. Is this an appropriate time to talk about the racial equity part? Please. Okay, great, fantastic, thank you. Um, okay, shifting gears back to the bigger area. Um, we've spent a number of months on this in a variety of forums. And so I took some time today to look through all of my <laughs> my uh, information and figure out the, the summary that I wanted to provide tonight, which is parallels, I think, some of what's in the slides. Um, and as usual, I wanted to start with the problems we're trying to solve and um, just bear with me while I list the three. The first would be actual and our perceived targeting um, based on race from the police department. A second would be reducing the likelihood of force being used in any encounter. And then third would be matching our community's needs to the right um, department or service. Um, so just sort of integrating what I've been learning over the course of this time. And it, it fits, I think, with um, some five, page, slide five and slide five really mostly. And then with the uh, detailed slides about policing and citywide practices. Um, so about actual and perceived targeting. Um, I do think it's important that we move forward with inclusion training for our city, for our staff, for our council. And I know a question came up on boards and commissions, I would include them as well. Um, I also think it's important that we accelerate the implementation of the state act that uh, the city manager was just referring to, the Racial and Identity Profiling Act. Um, I know we're intending to do that, but um, comparing that data to our population, I understand a resource may be needed to analyze the data and make recommendations, and I'll be supportive of that. Um, and then on to the, the force topic, which of course was the source of many of where, where a lot of this began. Um, we've spent a lot of time on policies and disciplines, and I, I think the main issue for me as I think about it is timing and transparency, and that's a little bit of what we discussed tonight. Um, so those are the things I'll be looking for as we go forward timing and transparency with respect to that. Um, I also think there was a really interesting session um, that Kepler's hosted in July, where a person, Professor Seth Stoughton said that the goal should be to get officers to take care of each other by intervening to prevent officers from career ending choices, and that this is how to protect fellow officers. So I think it's more than just policies and disciplines, uh, discipline. So I wanted to get that out there. Um, let's sit on two. And then um, on the third part, matching our community's needs um, to the right department. Um, I have two points I want to make. One is I think it would be appropriate for us to do an employee survey of the entire city. Um, and I think that should probably include that, that would include the police department as well. Um, it's a best practice that many of us in the private industry and elsewhere are used to. Um, and there can be a component that addresses how people feel. Um, in terms of their identity, what they've observed, what they've experienced. 
And then finally, tying it back to um, police officers, um, there's been an awful lot of information provided to us and for anyone listening at home, um, the report from August 26, which was an informational report, which was transmittal number three, has a great deal of useful information in there. And I wanna call everyone's attention to pages six and seven, um, because that was when I really started to get a feel for how our department, our police department spends their time. Um, and the vast difference between people who call in for help and offer an officer initiated stops just in terms of the, the number of them. Um, and it certainly jumped out at me and uh, there, I'm sure there are others as we begin this discussion um, that welfare checks are, you know, the second looks like in the top three reasons someone calls the police department. Um, if you look at some of the other information that's been provided, thinking about how Albuquerque uses a public health approach. I think that was in one of the other um, ad hocs. I think that's an, an area where it's worth considering if we have some different kind of department, right? That's social workers that has different um, resources and training that's available. And I don't know enough about what a welfare check looks like and how dangerous it might or might not be. Um, but that would sort of be the next step for me in terms of thinking um, how our police officers spend their time. Sorry for that long, long, uh, long, uh, list of things, but um, this is a meaty topic and we haven't had an opportunity to integrate before. So I'll stop there. Important comments and, and thank you for doing that work to, I guess, as you said, integrate some of it. That's, that's much appreciated by everyone. Any other comments or questions? Council Member Kuhn. Um, so I also wanna see that, you know, we're with um, legislation proposed legislation, state legislation, it's going to be um, being proposed towards the end of the year, I believe, December or so. Um, I think it's important for the city to start um, placing themselves in that position to carry forward SB 731 as well as SB 776. I think it's 776, yes. I, those are the two that didn't go through. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty important to have these two um, um, legislations to encourage um, our state folks to pass those. I think that is one step forward in making sure that you know we have um, we have accountability there. Uh, so those are the two. And then um, I would really like to see you know a, have a better understanding of our the the process for the IPAs, but also to expand their scope back to what it was previously, so that we. Um, um, we further the transparency and accountability in this. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, kind of a similar point that Lydia just made. I think, you know, we're, we're lucky to have the auditors here tonight. Uh, I hope we take taken advantage of that. It's kind of like um, when in this process can council discuss uh, potentially changing the police auditor scope. And I think we just signed a contract recently. Um, so maybe a question for staff. I mean, is there an ability for us to uh, modify that kind of big contract if we were interested in say an annual performance audit or uh, maybe expanding the things that are, that are referred to the auditor? I think the answer is yes. Uh, see, the attorney <laughs> may want to weigh in just in terms of uh, contractually what what that process would involve. Sure. So um, a contract can be amended if both sides agree. So um, if council's interested in that, um, I heard the IPA welcome that conversation as well. So I would right. imagine those would be straightforward negotiations. Right. So right now we have these these multiple ad hocs. I think at some point we have to figure out how we bring this process together and if if we desire to maybe add some things to the auditor's scope, you know, doing that in a holistic way that makes sense. So we kind of span these different ad hocs. Um, so that, that's kind of my my thought for tonight. And, and thank you, thanks again for, for both of you guys being here tonight. Great, um, council member Koo, another I'm sorry, I just have, I just thought of another question. So to uh, Mr. Connolly and Mr. Ganako, what does your community engagement look like? I mean, it, in the Santa Clara one, uh, Santa Clara County, when you're reporting and in their staff reports, it mentions that you have done 
community engagement or get community input. What does that look like? Sure. Um, for, this, for the county of Santa Clara, as a result of uh, one of the supervisors' referral, actually Palo Alto supervisor, Supervisor Samidian, he asked us to facilitate some listening sessions for the greater county community, <clears throat> which we did. Um, they focused on the eight can't wait and some broader issues of reimagining policing. And so we had two 90 minute sessions of community engagement with the assistance of the office of the CEO. Um, and we put it together and I think we had a total of 500 people in the two sessions we had on, on Zoom. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Niss. I'm sitting here thinking of what can we do or what can the police do with the public that um, leaves a lasting impression. And Adrian, you just said you saw the two police from two different communities coming together. Um, you don't know why, but you presume it was for something positive, right? Even if they didn't recognize you as the mayor. I, I presume so. They were in Johnson Park looking for something. That's all I right. can tell. Right. But trying to think of other ways that, that our community can really feel connected with the police. And I know they do. Um, I don't think that's, that's a question, but it may be that they would like to be more connected. So Bob, are you around again? I'm sorry to keep making you pop up, but um, is it appropriate for, well, I'll go back to the police academy in a minute, but is it appropriate for our residents to do ride alongs? Have they done that before? Yeah, we have done that, but especially under the pandemic, we're not uh, really recommending it. It's just not the greatest dynamic. We made some exceptions for some of the ad hoc members, but it's a program that right now we're kind of have under um, uh, wraps. But it's one that you might do normally. Yeah, it's one of the things actually that members of the Basic Citizen Academy participate in. So, you know, that's a program we've always offered at least right. three times a year. Right. Uh, for 2020, we've had to suspend those and, and take those more to the virtual platforms. So when, you know, when we're done with this heinous problem, that's something that you might go back to again, because people who've taken that program course, whatever you may call it, have really benefited from it and felt very differently about police. But I'm, I'm always left with the, the comment, um, especially that comes out of Sunnyvale, that you know everybody loves the firefighters, but they they feel a little more hesitant about the police. So my goal would be that people feel comfortable with the police and that they would reach out or take the program or do a ride along, whatever it, whatever it may be. It's a huge part of the service that we offer to our community. And then we might do the um, the questionnaire, Allison, I don't know what you called it exactly, a survey um, of our community. And I think we will do that as well um, to see what their response is. So, um, you know, there's, there's been a, a, a fascinating conversation going on throughout our country. I was interested to read, and I know that Adrian and I mentioned it earlier, that Minneapolis has, um, has dropped their defunding the police and gone back to a more traditional role. But I'm sure you knew that already. So when this is over, um, it'll be time for us to come back and, and do more hands-on, I hope, with our police department. And we look forward to doing that. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Janaka. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thanks to my colleagues and staff. Um, I think we can wrap this item up. Um, so gentlemen, thank you very much. For, oh, Mr. City Manager. Just one uh, footnote. I forgot to mention earlier for members of the public that are interested, there is a new, I refer to it as unredacted version of the police policy manual that is now available to the public. It's not completely unredacted, but it is substantially less redacted than was previously uh, available online. Uh, so thank you to the uh, 
I'm sure, and I know for a fact, laborious work by both the police department and the city's, city attorney's office uh, to update uh, that uh, so that much more information is now available online. Thanks for mentioning that. And thank you to all the parties for, for working on that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you gentlemen here. Pleasure. Bye. Okay, um, let's move on. Our next item of business is agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Just the one mention that item number one, our closed session will continue at the end of the meeting. Any other agenda changes? Mr. Mayor, none from staff. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We now move to oral communications where any member of the public may speak to an item not on the agenda. Uh, if you'd like to address the council, please raise your hand in Zoom or hit star nine on your phone. And if our city clerk would please help me uh, help those folks. Sure, Mayor Fine. At this time, we have one speaker, James Hendry. James, there you go, James, two minutes. Thank you very much, Council. Um, I just want to remind you that the reason we're being sued is because a couple of weeks ago, the Council chose to put a lot of um, kind of weights onto the Foothill Park opening program. Um, the Council had the opportunity to really move forward with that action, and they didn't, and the city is now being sued. So thank you very much. Uh, just, yeah. Thank you, James. Any other, mem any other members of the public that wish to speak on any item not on the agenda, please raise your hand or dial star nine at this time. Mayor Fine, there's no other hands. All right, thank you to our one speaker. Um, that closes our oral communications. We now move to minutes approval for the minutes of September 14th, 2020. Uh, I will move those minutes. Second. Thank you. Do any members of the public wish to speak to our minutes approval? Any members of the public wishing to speak to minutes approval? Please raise your hand or dial star nine. Mayor Fine, there are no hands up. Thank you, Clerk Miner. Okay, uh, motion by myself, seconded by Council Member Cormack for the minutes, item number three. Uh, let's please vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. Council Member Philseth? Yes. I'm a yes. Council Member Niss? Yes. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. We now move to the consent calendar items four through nine. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to the consent calendar? Any members that wish to speak to any item on the consent calendar, please raise your hand or dial star nine at this time. Mayor Fine, there are no hands raised. Okay. I'd move uh, approval. Second. Um, yeah, just hold on. I'm seeing one hand go up and down on the attendees. That's Mr. James, and I think it he may be waiting to speak on something else. Okay, Mr. James, if you'd like to speak on the consent calendar, please please raise your hand and leave it up. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't catch the motion. Um, Council Member Ness moved, and I seconded. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, and Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, I'm going to vote no on uh, six. Okay. Um, if there is no further discussion, I'm going to suggest we vote. Council Member Filseth? Yes. I'm a yes. Council Member Niss? Yes. Council Member Ku? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Uh, yes. Council Member Cormack? Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois? Yes. So that passes uh, unanimously with Council Member Tanaka voting no on six, uh, which will bring us to city manager comments. Mr. Shikata. Um, Mr. You're fine. Yep. Usually the no oh, yep. gets to speak. Mr. Tanaka, sorry. Council Member. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm voting no on six, which is uh, a uh, contract to extend the procurement <laughs> services, ironically. 
Um, and the reason why I'm voting no is it may be okay, but um, it refers to a attachment, which I've clicked everyone in this document, I've emailed Beth and Ed, um, although maybe not soon enough on this, that has the schedule of rates. So I don't feel comfortable approving a contract where I don't know what the schedule of rates are and what the, what the fees are gonna be. Um, it's not for a lot of money, but it's still $170,000, um, $85,000 extension. And I think in these tight times, I don't think it's appropriate for us to be approving things when we don't know how much it's gonna cost. So hopefully, um, maybe in your guys' printed packet, it's okay, but in my electronic version, I cannot find it. I've kept clicking everywhere on this and I cannot find it. So I think we need to improve the quality a bit of our, of our, um, of our online documents because I think members of the public also use this. And um, um, I wish I could also approve this, but uh, I can't if, if I don't know how much it's gonna cost. If I could just get one clarification from the city clerk. Uh, it looked like there was a discrepancy on the listing of items that you had. Item six was shown. It should be this uh, management partners agreement. Okay, good. Because I thought it was the, I'm sorry, the voting delegate. Got it. No, I think that the management partners on the exhibit that he may be referring to <laughs> may be in the original contract. Right, that's and correct. And that wasn't added to it. Gotcha. Yes. So just either thinking, in the printed or online. No, I right. Understood. And I, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor and council members. Okay. I was just uh, a little confused by the numbering on that screen. And just for confirmation, what the city clerk um, just described is accurate that the schedule of rates was on the original contract. And the item that's before you on the consent calendar is simply an amendment that does not change the schedule of rates. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Floor is yours. Still. Thank you. Uh, oh boy. And then let me switch to being able to share screen if I could. Let's see if we can do this. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you've got that now. I actually have a few items of interest for the community that. Uh, I, I suspect we we'll want to go through quickly, but nonetheless, uh, let me make sure it can cover the bases. Uh, first off, uh, as was noted last week, uh, the uh, Halloween is obviously upcoming. And uh, just today, uh, this Monday, the county public health officer, along with other county health officers in the Bay Area, released guidance on some recommendations for Halloween safe uh, safety, uh, health safety on low and medium risk activities. So we have uh, uh, worked as quickly as we could to put together this information with some additional information that we had uh, already in the work uh, based on the Center for Centers for uh, CDC. Lose track of that for the moment. Uh, and uh, are working on a web page that will be able to provide that information uh, in as simple form as we can for the community. In addition, we are uh, hosting a Halloween neighborhood resource meeting that will be a Zoom session uh, this coming Wednesday at 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, where we will be able to, again, provide that information in an online format. I believe we'll be able to record that and have that available for members of the community that are interested in getting both some uh, basic information on guidance, as well as we're hoping it will be an opportunity for neighbors to share some of the creativity that I'm sure is already in the works uh, as to how they are planning to um, really express the creativity that is Palo Alto in how to celebrate uh, Halloween uh, this uh, holiday in ways that are in keeping with our socially distant uh, environment that is really important at this particular moment in time. Um, we will also uh, see uh, if there is interest in some follow-up discussions in order to share neighbor to neighbor uh, type information. I would note uh, for general information that many of the uh, annual holiday decorations that we have seen in Old Palo Alto in particular and elsewhere, we understand are either being dramatically scaled back or will not be happening at all. So the uh, basic guidance is stay close to home 
and uh, really reduce the likelihood or the necessity of traveling to any area that will be a large gathering. So as a part of the work that's upcoming, you'll see uh, a number of suggestions and programs that the city is trying to organize that will allow uh, as much of the activities to spread out over time as possible. Next, uh, then turning from what will hopefully be a very uh, pleasant Halloween to ongoing issues with wildfires, would note that uh, our city is participating along with uh, many agencies in providing support uh, through mutual aid. Uh, and our uh, fire personnel are deployed uh, and we thank them uh, for that ongoing service. Uh, just to give you a quick snapshot on current activities, this morning, one of our engines, engine 65, uh, was deployed to the glass fire uh, in Napa and Sonoma counties uh, with, uh, and I'll uh, just make note uh, for your uh, reading the statistics that are here in terms of the current status of the fires. Uh, we have had a battalion chief who has now returned home uh, from the North Fire Complex where he was training to be a strike team leader. And then finally, we have a captain and fire engineer that are part of a task force uh, that is now returned from the North Complex fire as well. Next, uh, with the ongoing and expected continuing heat uh, that our cooling center or community respite center at Mitchell Park uh, will remain open this week. Uh, as general guidance to the community, uh, certainly want to try to stay indoors and reduce outdoor activity as much as possible. Uh, again, uh, presuming that uh, heat and smoke are, are um, manageable more indoors. Uh, and so for those who do need another uh, location uh, for uh, rest uh, that our Mitchell Park Community Center uh, Cooling Center will be available through Friday uh, during the hours of 8, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. with uh, socially distant uh, protocols as well. And then finally, want to note uh, that we've had some progress on an item that has been discussed some over the course of time around airplane noise. Uh, we have been working with the city of Menlo Park uh, as well as uh, SFO staff in order to provide temporary uh, monitoring location. This is a part of ongoing advocacy that Palo Alto has had with SFO in order to uh, enhance ongoing monitoring. So at this point, we anticipate that we'll be able to see a temporary uh, noise monitor uh, installed uh, very shortly, if not already uh, put in place uh, that can hopefully lead to the uh, evaluation and decision to place permanent noise monitors. So we appreciate also members of the community that have been working with our staff on that work. And then uh, finally, in terms of the um, ongoing uh, RPP enforcement, we do want to note that as part of your packet uh, this evening, uh, there is a notification that we want to ensure that members of the community are aware of that RPP enforcement will begin middle of this month. Uh, we'll, uh, as you'd expect, start with a warm up time, a uh, warning period uh, that will precede actual uh, citations. In the meanwhile, our time limit restrictions in other parts of the city will, conti will continue to be suspended. Uh, so only RPP parking uh, enforcement in terms of time limits uh, will be uh, starting back up again, middle of October. And then as I noted earlier, uh, we've uh, had an update to the city's policy manual that is now online. And then the final uh, item here is just to note uh, for the community's awareness, October is National Cybersecurity Month. Uh, and we have an informational uh, report in tonight's agenda packet uh, on that regard as well. Very important for our organization as well as uh, community members as well to be aware of uh, cybersecurity risks and uh, take steps accordingly. And that is uh, the conclusion of my report. Mr. Mayor, members of the Thank council. You, Thank you, Mr. City Manager. If there are any um, short follow-up questions, uh, I see you, Council Member Ness. Uh, City Manager, would you discuss Station 8 and the coverage? Because I know there, there are people in that area who have either had warnings or evacuation of an evacuation or may have heard of one close by. So just to give an idea, because that's sort of our outpost. 
Uh, let's see. Yes, as general rule, Station 8 at Foothills Park uh, is staffed during uh, red flag warning days. Uh, and uh, so staff is uh, provided there uh, on an overtime basis. Uh, council may also be aware, or members of the community may also be aware that there is some discussion uh, relative to the Los Altos Hills Fire District uh, that will be coming to the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for discussion. Uh, so there are ongoing uh, discussions uh, there um, in terms of future uh, staffing levels, but uh, nothing that is affecting today's uh, level of uh, fire protection. So am I right that in the not too distant past, we would have somebody at station eight for most of the fire season, regardless of red flag days? Um, I would note that uh, we have had a reduction in staffing availability for that purpose. I wouldn't be able to speak specifically on what, is, what has been our past practice versus current. So I, I just know that this year people are very uneasy. Um, we have good friends who live in the Napa Sonoma area and um, they, they live in constant fear um, with good reason as it turns out. So I wonder for some of our, so, some of our you know, residents who live up close to that area, it probably is, is unnerving. So I want us to be aware of that. And I, I know Geo is aware of it, but just to call it out that we have it on our radar screen and maybe we'll get some help from Los Altos Hills. Thank you, council member. Council member Koo. Um, thank you for, re, uh, for the enforcement of the RPPs, um, but could you also just make a, take a look and ensure that the application process is easy on online. I hear some uh, concerns that it's not easy to access and to get the permits. Thank you. Thank you. That feedback to the staff. Vice Mayor and then Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, sorry to try to say, I've heard the same. So it's great if you take a look at that. Council Member Tanaka. Um, so two quick things. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, like staff reports, if it says that it's attached and made part of the report, I kind of expect it to be attached and made part of the report. And that's kind of also why I voted no on six. But the second question for you, uh, city manager, is um, in terms of the old Palo Alto RPP, do, you, do we have a date for that yet? I don't have that at my fingertips, but yes, that is coming back imminently. Before, before the 31st, I think. Unless... Before the program expires, right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, thank you, Mr. City Manager, and thanks to my colleagues. I'm gonna suggest we take a five minute break, uh, come back at 9.06 and we'll get on to item number 10. Thanks everyone.
is a status report and direction regarding continued participation in the San Mateo County Tourism Business Improvement District, also known as the TBID, or adoption of a resolution to withdraw participation. Does our staff have a presentation here? Yes, and please give me a minute while I share my screen. Let me introduce Kara Apple, who is on special assignment to the city manager's office and uh, just grabbing a hold of uh, things that need to be resolved, and this being one of them. So thank you, Kara. Absolutely, Kara. I've seen you over many different business support things, so we really appreciate your outreach to that community. Happy to help. And everyone hear me and see my screen? Uh -huh. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shikata. Good evening, Mayor Fine and Council members. Um, uh, I'm going to briefly start a presentation um, that will go about, will review the history of the TBID, um, quick, so quick background, poll results, resource impacts, and stakeholder engagement as it relates to Palo Alto Hotel properties wishing to withdraw from the San Mateo County uh, TBID the Tourism Business Improvement District. I'm hoping my slide is not advancing. Bear with me one moment. There we go. Thank you for your patience. Um, so in March of 2010, the Palo Alto City Council voted to adopt a resolution which would include Palo Alto in the boundaries of the San Mateo County's TBID. In December, um, stakeholders requested the city to withdraw from the TBID. Um, <clears throat> council direction in December of 2019 was to um, delay the withdrawal of the TBID which would allow the um, San Mateo County Convention and Visitors Bureau to engage the hoteliers and then also for staff to lead a stakeholder uh, outreach and pull the hotels and then return to council in the fall, which leads us to today. Um, council will hear the updated poll results and you can use that as a basis of your decision um, for um, determining the staff recommendations. So in this slide, you'll see uh, it includes all 27 hotel properties and then also the San Mateo Silicon Valley Convention and Visitors Bureau, as well as the Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce. Staff was able to successfully contact 26 of the 27 hotel properties, um, which are included in this poll. What you'll see before you is a breakdown of the three, uh, the poll results and the, the three um, graphs break down as follows. So it's the breakdown of the votes. So 20 of the 27 properties wish to withdraw from the TBID and that represents 74% of the total properties. With regards to the hotel rooms, there are a total of 2,112 hotel rooms across all 27 hotel properties and 75% of those properties wish to withdraw from the TBID. And then finally, looking at the graph at the bottom, for the total assessment fees paid by Palo Alto Hotels to the San Mateo County TBID, the total assessment is just under about $310,000. So of that, you'll see that 243,000 wish to withdraw and only 65,000 um, of the represented total dollars of the assessment wish to remain in the TBID. So a couple notable resource impacts to mention is that uh, there will be no regional representation for Palo Alto. So Palo Alto hotels are represented by on a state level through Visit California, but there will be no regional representation. Um, and then there will be a fiscal impact to the Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce. Of the total uh, TBID assessment fees, just under 32,000 of that is passed back to the Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce. And that those funds are used to uh, fund the chamber for their uh, work on resource and advertising of the Palo Alto hotels on a, a local level. 
there have been no city funds budgeted to support visitor services going forward should um, the council uh, decide to approve the um, um, recommendation. And then second of all, um, there's no plans at this time for any replacement. So those are just a few of the notable um, resource impacts at this time. So for stakeholder feedback, I've asked two panelists to speak tonight. The first is Mr. David Dworkin. He is the president of One Stop Integration, and it's the management company of uh, the Comfort Inn. And he will be speaking on behalf of the hoteliers that wish to uh, withdraw from the TBID. And then he will be followed by Mr. John Hutar. He is the president and CEO of the San Mateo Silicon Valley Convention and Visitors Bureau. So Mr. Dworkin, if you're ready, you can speak now. Let me unshare my screen. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Mayor Fine, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Again, my name is David Dworkin with One Stop Integration, your hotel management company, and we represent the Comfort in Palo Alto. Additionally, I'm speaking on behalf of the motels. In nearly six years, the Palo Alto hotels have contributed $1.8 million to the CVB. And this has reportedly generated 4,460 total room nights. But at an estimated rate, uh, uh, room rate of $225, the return on investment is approximately $1 million or 56% rate of return. The standard expectation or practice of sales efforts as discussed with uh, BB just yesterday is that we expect at least a 6x rate of return. Furthermore, hotels need business on shoulder days. And that's gonna be your Sundays and Thursdays, as well as weekends, not the largely weekday leads that are received. Our current hotel count is that 21 hotels have chosen to opt out of the CVB, two want to stay in, and four have abstained. Bid requirements uh, typically require only a simple majority of hotels to vote to, to opt out both the largest contributors to and the recipients of the actual room bookings want to opt out. As far as the motels, all the motels, every single one of the motels except for one wants to opt out. Motels have not received any viable leads. They've received $0 and zero room nights according to the report given. After the city, city meeting last year, I met with John Hutar, who's president of the San Mateo CVB, to discuss the hotel and motel's position. We had a very productive meeting, and I informed John that our position is and will be to support the hotel's decision on whether or not to continue. I want to personally thank John and his staff for the quick pivot over the last year and their efforts to make the CVB effective for Palo Alto. Although appreciated, the results speak for themselves, and the hotel still wish to opt out. I had a chance to review the San Mateo CVB memo dated 922. I want to point out a couple items. As was stated in item one, approximately 50% of the hotels chose not to pass along the bid fees. And that is because they feel it creates a competitive disadvantage as buying decisions come down to dollars and cents for what we call road wires. And those are people paying out of pocket. Hoteliers don't want to lose room revenue to neighboring cities of Mountain View and Sunnyvale. And that's why we bear the cost. Item eight mentions that roughly $30,000 of annual funding helps subsidize the Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. I wanna mention that all the hotels and motels are advocates of the chamber and chambers across the country. And we hope that they can track new funding, but uh, not through the, the bid. Again, I wanna remind everyone that bid requirements basically state that it has to drive room nights and we have not seen the results. Um, again, we're still in uh, full support of the chamber. One year ago, the hotels wanted to leave the bid, as mentioned. But in 2020, we have COVID-19 and other factors that have changed the landscape for us, not just for 2020, but for the foreseeable future. Many hotels are still closed, and all hotels are losing money. A hotel next door that we sold has been closed with no reopening date. Um, whether you're closed and, and having to pay for labor to uh, keep your hotel safe or you're open to keep employees, uh, again, employed, 
uh, we're all losing money. But continuing to pay the bid fees, which are fixed in many cases, is a detriment to the continuing operations of all hotels who have severe financial hardships. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Dworkin. Uh, Mr. Hutar? Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor Fine and uh, Palo Alto City Council members. Uh, I'd like to take a few moments to give you some highlights <coughs> of the report I submitted to you on September 22nd. Uh, after our last uh, December meeting, our Bureau's work began in earnest to deliver on the commitments we made. We invested in local advertising, created a landing page on our website exclusively for Palo Alto, restructured our sales team with a focus on better serving Palo Alto hotels. With the onset of COVID, we quickly had to pivot. In April, our board proactively reduced hotel assessment fees by 50%. Uh, I did point this out to staff that the figures they're using is, is full assessment, which uh, was again, reduced in half uh, proactively in April. We engaged in advocacy with elected officials to make sure that they understood the profound level of hurt suffered by members we represent. We facilitated the development and training of new safety and sanitation protocols. Uh, in our house, we eliminated 50% of our staff and eliminated any expenses that were not absolutely necessary. Marketing in the COVID and post-COVID era will require a huge amount of heavy lifting. We are now pivoting our sales and marketing efforts to focus on attracting more leisure vis visitors as a strategy to drive occupancy until corporate, group, and international travelers return. We have invested more energy in curating blogs, amplifying our message in social media platforms, partnering with Visit California, partnering with Cal Travel uh, to have a unified message to the traveling public. We've continued financial support of the Palo Alto Visitor Center, even though the office has been closed and visitor staff eliminated since the shelter order took place in March. Our CVB will mark its 50th anniversary in 2021. While many things have changed during the past 50 years, and especially in the last six months, we have always taken our responsibility of destination sales and marketing seriously. Uh, as I pointed out in our report, since 2015, our sales efforts generated 2.7 million in economic impact for Palo Alto from group room nights uh, that's the part that is tangible and, and measurable. Uh, and then on top of that, there is the public relations, uh, the, the press, and, and all of the, the other elements we, we work on. Um, and it's a body of work that we are most proud of. And I uh, remain at your disposal if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hutar. Let me uh, share my screen again. So finally, the uh, staff recommendations are to adopt the resolution, resolution and uh, have City of Burlingame uh, make all reasonable steps to implement the withdrawal from the San Mateo County Tourism Business Improvement District, which the effective date will be January 2021, and then also to authorize the city manager to negotiate and pay any necessary and reasonable administrative costs to City of Burlingame to make that happen or B, um, direct staff to transmit to the city of Burley game a letter confirming that the city of Palo Alto intends to maintain its participation in the San Mateo County TBID and provide direction to staff on next steps. Uh, this concludes the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just one uh, clarifying question before we go to our members of the public. Um, is, is there a deadline for us to take an action on this and, and what would that be? Yes, um, we, if council uh, votes to approve the resolution, it will need to be submitted to the city of Burlingame. Um, their first reading would be on October 19th and their second reading would be on November 2nd. Uh, also slated on the city of Burlingame's um, 
agenda for November 2nd is their resolution of intent to assess for 2021. So the second reading to withdraw Palo Alto would be calendared prior to the resolution with the intent to pay 2021. Thank you. So as soon as possible, if that's the route we want yes. to take. Thank you so much. Okay, um, let's please go to members of the public who may wish to speak on this item, item number 10, about the Tourism Business Improvement District. Uh, and if the clerk would please help me, uh, help these folks provide their comments. Any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, the TBID, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. I'm going to check with uh, Mr. James to see if he wanted to speak on this or not. I'm unable to reach you. So I'm Aaron, do you want to speak? You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak up about uh, my desire to end the cover up regarding Zach Perone tonight. However, I, what I did want to say is, first of all, I wanted to uh, uh, comment positively about uh, Council Member Cormack's comments that this, the IPA matter did not seem- Aaron, we're talking about the uh, I, Tourism Bureau item and not- I understand, but I tried to get in on the oral communications and uh, I wasn't acknowledged. So I'd like to have leave to speak on the oral communications topic, please. Mr. James, I'll, I'll apologize for that on behalf of the council. Uh, we, we did leave extra time asking for your comment, um, but at this time we've moved on our business to the Tourism Business Improvement District. Well, if you, okay. if please, like settle to, the, please settle the Foothills uh, Park matter tonight. It's sir, we're talking about the Tourism and Business Improvement District. I understand, but I tried very diligently to get in on the other matter. I, I apologize for that. Well, I understand, and you can take care of that. Would you like to speak on this matter or not? We have another speaker, Charlie. Yes, good evening. Charlie, go ahead. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Did you want to Thank speak? You. The yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. The Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center is the key point of support for visitors to Palo Alto on business or leisure travel. The Visitor Center staff is the face of Palo Alto to the outside world that sets the first welcoming and helpful tone for those who are pursuing personal or professional activities in our city. The Chamber has been a stakeholder in the Hotel T-Bid with San Mateo County, Silicon Valley Convention and Visitors Bureau since its formation, and over the past decade, the Visitor Center has become an essential part of the Chamber's mission and service to the community. The Visitor Center receives its only financial support from the Convention and Visitors Bureau through the funding it receives from the hotels. The nearly $32,000 received annually has been essential to support the work that to serve the hundreds of requests for help, as well as to maintain the visitor center resources. As a referral and consultation service, the Chamber's Visitor Center supports our local economy and helps maximize revenues by providing information for free about all Palo Alto, Palo Alto hotels and restaurants, not just our Chamber members. What began simply as a hotel referral and visitor support service has evolved into a far more robust venue of services to a wide variety of stakeholders that are directly or indirectly connected to the hotel sector, such as restaurants and retail businesses. We understand that a majority of the Palo Alto hotels have expressed their desire to disband the T-bid. Our position is not to object to the wishes of our hotel members. However, we want to stress the termination of the T-bid would end the financial support it provides to the chamber to serve as a visitor center with no plan to replace the funding. We respectfully request that should the T-bed be allowed to disband, city council direct staff to develop a strategy and identify a source or sources of funds to replace the lost T-bed support so the chamber can continue without interruption to serve as the visitor center. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And our next speaker is a phone caller with the last three digits of 287. You may have to unmute. There you go. 
Hi, sorry. I, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Fine, uh, Vice Mayor Du Bois, and Council members. This is Yatin uh, Patel, uh, and I represent Hotel Parmani. Um, I did send in a letter, but I just thought I'd hop on the call and provide some quick uh, quick input feedback. First, I want to start with uh, game, uh, Kara Apple. Um, you know, to the extent anybody on this uh, meeting needs to hear about her, you know, amazing, diligent outreach, um, I wanted to acknowledge her because as a uh, family that's done business here, uh, we really haven't had that level of outreach, and I certainly appreciate it. Uh, I know many of my colleagues do as well. Um, you know, I think it's a basic, basic uh, human desire to be heard and understood um, no matter what happens. And you know, she, to her credit, she took a lot of time uh, and effort to understand our positions. Um, for for a small motel like us, you know, I, I don't know if you've had occasion to read what I've written, but you know, participation in the T bid makes absolutely no sense. Um, we certainly didn't have any input uh, when it was organized in 2010. Um, and I think what's further, what's even more telling is that no matter what you know, data or sales numbers anybody's throwing out, four of the four, five original hotels that were involved in um, making participation happen for all hotels want out. Uh, presumably, they know their sales data better than better than anyone else. Uh, and I think what this really boils down to is um, the hotels having the agency to make the choice on their own behalf. You know, we are the hoteliers and in the best position to make, make that judgment. And, you know, my wish is that council recognizes that and uh, votes accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand or dial star nine. We have another caller, last three digits of 101. You may need to unmute from your end. There you go. Uh, I apologize for that. This is Stephanie uh, Wansett from the Cardinal Hotel. Hello, Mayor Fine and council members. I also wrote in an email, uh, but again, just calling to reiterate the key point in my mind is, you know, that we came a year ago with uh, data that is, has been corroborated by the outreach that Kara did that, as Yakin said, we all really appreciated her work and efforts. And the numbers have come back even stronger than a year ago by, you know, I think more than 10% in terms of room numbers and in terms of financial contribution. And I think that says a lot. And uh, to echo my colleague, I do think it is important that the hoteliers who have these businesses to run uh, have the ability to say what they find valuable in terms of generating business and how we spend our revenue, especially in these uh, pandemic and post-pandemic times that are especially challenging. So uh, thank you very much. And I hope that you vote in favor of letting the hotels withdraw from the TBID. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Any other members of the public? Uh, we have Barbara Gross. Hi. Barbara, go ahead. Yes, thank you, um, council members. I want to present two pieces of information. One is that um, it was made clear to uh, the group who presented the petition in 2019 that the responsibility of the council was to verify the information that was um, presented to you in terms of uh, the outreach that had been uh, conducted with 
all the hotels. And so as um, Kara has um, continued that outreach in 2020 on behalf of the, uh, of the council and confirm the information um, and, you know, and the numbers changed a little bit um, in favor of withdrawing that the council respect the professional wish wishes of the, you know, of the people who are um, engaged in the TBID and the payment of supporting the TBID. So it's not a question of looking at, you know, what, um, how the organizations interact or um, you know, what you might see or not see in terms of referrals and numbers and so on. Um, it really comes down to respecting the wishes of the hoteliers. And the second part has to do with the Chamber of Commerce. As a former chair of the board of the Cha Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce, I think that it's time for the chamber and the city to engage in conversation regarding um, a visitor's uh, funding a visit center and being able to feel those incoming phone calls um, that, that the chamber receives. And so it's not dependent solely on the hotel industry as the food and beverage industry and retail industry also benefit from that as well. So thank you. I look forward to doing that conversation. Thank you, Barbara. Any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. Mayor, fine, there's no other hands raised. Thank you, Clerk Miner. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, thank you to Mr. Dworkin and Mr. Hutar and Lieutenant Apple. Thank you for all your hard work on this and, and to others in the city manager's office. Um, before I go to my colleagues, I just have a quick couple of comments on this one. Um, when this came to us last year, we had a pretty contentious meeting, and I think a lot of it boiled down to council's inability to read call it the data about the, the will of the hotel community to continue participating or withdrawing uh, from the business improvement district. Um, whether you like it or not, that decision does rest with this city council, uh, and Burlingame implements that decision. Um, I think now the data is abundantly clear that we have 75% of our hotel rooms, our hoteliers, and the, the revenue um, voting to exit the TBID. And so that is what I would support tonight. I do want to send my thanks to Mr. Hutar and, and the Convention Bureau and the TBID. I am a big booster of organizations like yours, and I think they play an important role. Um, but I think we also have to listen to our hotels uh, in Palo Alto, and this is a pretty exceptional year and maybe there's an opportunity in the future to collaborate again. Um, with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues for comments, questions, and motions. Council Member Ness. You're on mute, Lou. Spent a year on this, and we, I, I think it's pretty clear that there isn't any support for the BID anymore. But from the BID came the money that supported the chamber and the Visitors Bureau and so forth. And oh, I can't quite imagine a city our size and with the importance that it has had in the, um, in the visitors, hotel and so forth community. I can't imagine that we would completely drop that. So I would like to consider that and I don't know what, be, what would be an appropriate time, but I think we should consider putting some amount of money into that in order for them to continue to function as, a, as an outreach into the community. And I think they also do that for Stanford. Uh, the problem or the issue currently is that there is no hotel business. There's no business of any kind, but we certainly will hope that within the next six months to a year, we see something different happening. So I did notice today that the, um, the business community is demanding of the Board of Supervisors that they start to open um, far more of their restaurants and businesses than they have in the past. And there was some real pushback 
from Susan Ellenberg about that, um, if you happen to, to read the press today. So I would like us to consider that at the same time, but I would need to look to our city manager to find out what would be an appropriate time to bring that back. Well, to the extent that uh, the council is considering a general fund allocation, if that were the um, suggestion uh, that perhaps the soonest point at which that could be considered is when you are receiving a update on the status of our own uh, fiscal uh, situation that's scheduled for uh, mid-October. So we could take a, take a look at it within that context. Um, I suspect knowing the council's interest that you'd also want us to have a understanding of exactly what we were paying for. Exactly. Uh, both in terms of the frequency of use as well as uh, any metrics we might have on the value of, of that. I mean, on its face, this is tragedy of the commons uh, where it's folks realize it's important but not important enough to pay for. So it uh, perhaps is a, a debate uh, and ultimately discussion of uh, source of funds. Well, I think though right now, if I were a hotel being asked to give any, any more than I could, when only 10% of my beds are full, I, I would probably say no as well. I think this is a, a terrible time for hotels. And um, I don't know how most of them are, are staying in business at all at this point. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, I, I had office hours yesterday talking to a lot of the hotel um, operators and it's it's really tough times. I mean, there's hotels just totally shut down. Um, they could barely make it, yet they are still compelled to pay this fee. Um, I think staff did an excellent job in surveying so Carl, thank you for going out there and surveying the hotels. It sounded like she got most of them, uh, which is great. Um, so there's no mystery about what people think. Um, you know, when, when you're not making money you have to, and you have this expense, it's really, really hard to make it. And um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's past time that we make the right decisions uh, for the hotels in our city. So I, I, think, um, I think what staff wrote here in the recommended motion makes a lot of sense. So I'd like to make the motion that we adopt the resolution attachment C and direct staff to transmit the resolution to the city of Burlingame with a request to take all steps necessary to implement withdrawal from the San County Tourism Business Improvement District effective January, 2021 Authorize the second. Manager. What? I was second. waiting for him. To oh, okay. Sorry. I think you, you can do it then. I think you got a second from Council Member Filseth. Just confirming is that letter A of the staff recommendation? Letter A, yes. Okay. I think I just finished reading it because you guys have it already. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Please, please speak to your motion. Well, you know, I, I, I spoke to it last time around. Um, if it was a really useful marketing expense, the hotels would do it. Um, last time they were not very supportive of it this time we have definitely a lot more data of all the how all the hotels fill um to me to compel them to be part of this even if even if they doesn't they don't want to they don't feel they don't see the, the their necessary return on investment to me doesn't seem appropriate especially right now when the hotels are, are suffering we have some of the highest uh, tot in the state if not the country um so i don't think we want to add field of fire in terms of the, the suffering that these hotels are are are, are feeling right now I mean, Stafford's not coming back. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty dire, guys. So I think we need to do the right thing here. So I don't think there's going to be too much debate on this, but I could be totally wrong. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Filseth. Yeah, just briefly, I, I, I see the city's role in this as primarily operational and facilitating uh, as opposed to uh, policy. Um, if the hotels don't want to do it, and it uh, seems pretty clear they don't, and I don't think it's the role of the council to get in the middle of that. Thanks. Council member Cormack. I'm happy to speak to this motion and support it. Um, my vote last year was based on the fact that the information was not provided to us by the staff. And um, I, that was concerning to me. So um, I'll add my thanks to Lieutenant Apple for the outreach and uh, work that she has done, which is clearly appreciated. Um, I want to just pull a quote from the email from Mr. Robosio at the Sheraton um, in which he says, we all tried. So I don't want anyone to view this as a failure. 
Um, this came out of the recession out of 2010, um, but many things have changed since then, including how people find and book hotel rooms. Um, so I'm certainly grateful to Mr. Hutar and his staff, and they've clearly tried very hard this year. And then of course we've had um, COVID, which has changed everything. Um, in the event that there is an amendment that's related to funding the um, visitor center, um, I will be open to learning more about that, but I will want to understand um, what hundreds of requests look like. Um, and I, in reviewing the guide, which appears to be primarily online, I, I um, perhaps I missed something, but I did not find it um, as helpful as perhaps I, I would have expected. So while I'm not opposed to hearing about it in the context of all of the other um, requests and demands that we will have, I'm, I'm not yet sure that I'd be supportive of that. Um, and again, um, thank you to um, everyone who participated last time and is back this time. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Koo. Um, so I was just wondering, what is uh, approximately, what is the reasonable administrative cost of the city to Burlingame? I have that if you'll give me just a second. And while you're looking that up, um, Ms. Apple, I just want to say thank you for your very thorough outreach also. My pleasure. Um, so the rates that I was quoted by the finance director of the city of Burlingame, um, for the city attorney, it's $231.40 per hour and a rate for an assistant city attorney would be $141.28 per hour. So it's the rates, those rates would uh, cover the cost for them to uh, write the ordinance and transmit it on their end. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll be supportive of this motion as well. Um, we did we did try to work with it and um, uh, and at this point, we can see that everybody's hurting. So um, I will support it. And in terms of the uh, chamber, I think that um, I, I think that we need to kind of look at what are the costs, um, exactly what Council Member Cormac had said. What does that look like? But also, I would think that it's something that should be worked out between the chamber and the hotels. Um, but open to discussing it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I am going to move us along and call the vote. Um, I'm up first. Uh, I vote yes. Council Member Niss. Yes. Uh, Council Member Koo. Yes. Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Council Member Cormack. Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois. Yes. Council Member Philseth. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to our partners in the San Mateo, San Mateo County uh, Tourism Business Improvement District. And thank you to all of our hotel uh, operators here in Palo Alto for attending, and Lieutenant Apple and uh, Mr. Chicago and others involved. Thank you for all your work on this. OK, um, let's move on to item number 11. I'll just read the whole title to be clear about this one. This is the approval of a contract with Baker Tilly US LLP for internal auditor services in an amount not to exceed $1.3 million for a term commencing October 1st, 2020, just a few days, uh, through June 30th of 2022, including approval of four initial task orders. There's also the adoption of a resolution to appoint Mr. Kyle O'Rourke of Baker Tilly US LLP as the Palo Alto City Auditor, an amendment of the table of organization to eliminate four positions in the various funds. Um, just setting this up a little bit. We're hoping to do three things tonight. One is approve that contract with the firm Baker Tilly. Two, uh, appoint Mr. Kyle O'Rourke, who you may see on the video now as the Palo Alto City Auditor. And three, uh, approve amendments to the table of organization. Um, in terms of order here, 
Um, first, do want to thank our CAO committee this year, Council Member Nisk, Cormac, and Philseth, especially Council Member Philseth, who was mayor last year uh, and as a CAO member has worked really hard on this. I believe uh, Council Member Philseth has a PowerPoint. Then we'll go to the public, then come back to Council for comments, questions, and motions, um, and then turn it over to Mr. O'Rourke at the end. Um, so I guess with that, is there anything from staff before I go to Council Member Philseth? All right, council member, uh, I believe you have a presentation or? Uh, yeah, thank you, the, the clerk has to. So uh, thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> so this is uh, not the normal process, uh, but the city auditor is a council department, not a city manager a department. And uh, so this was, uh, 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 this process was supervised by the CAO committee and uh, the CAO committee appointed an auditor ad hoc subcommittee um, and since that was me, um, I get to do the presentation. Uh, let's see. Um, so can I have slide one, please? Uh, hey, Nelly, can I have slide one, please? Uh, thank you. Um, so the items uh, tonight, as the mayor mentioned, are to approve the contract, uh, to appoint Mr. O'Rourke, and to amend the city's table of organization uh, appropriately with the outsource. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the agreement with Baker Tilly uh, is uh, nominally a two-year agreement, but shorter to align with the city's fiscal year. Um, so uh, it is 21 months uh, uh, through June 30th of 2022. Um, it can be terminated by the council on any reason upon 10 days for any reason upon 10 days notice, uh, with cause or without cause. Um, and extensions are by uh, mutual approval. Uh, at the end of uh, June uh, 2022. Uh, the value of the contract is nominally $750,000 a year. It's prorated this year because it's a shorter year. Uh, so it's not to exceed uh, $1.3 million through June 2022. And that's a not to exceed uh, because it's, it's gonna be billed as time and materials during uh, that, uh, that time. Um, the uh, services provided are basically the full array of internal auditing services. So uh, we'll talk briefly about this later, but uh, comprehensive risk assessment and the audit plan, uh, audits, uh, program performance and control audits. Uh, the expectation is that there will be six audits per year, uh, four major ones and two smaller ones, uh, and a handful of, diff of uh, smaller projects uh, as well. And I would note that this is actually an increase, uh, a modest increase from what we've had over the last few years. Uh, and also a slight, uh, at a slight cost decrease. And I add that uh, the, uh, the RFP that we issued, we had six respondents to the RFP. And in the RFP, we asked people, uh, what, would you, what would you be able to do for us at the target budget of $750,000 a year? But we also asked them uh, if you had another $200,000 per year, which basically took the contract to pretty much where the uh, the, the budget had been pre or the spending had been in previous years, what would you do with the extra $200,000 a year? And by and large, the answer was, you know, a little more of the same stuff in, uh, in section C. Um, and that was true for all the respondents. And so in the event, uh, we uh, 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 chose a, uh, uh, mutually chose to, with the, uh, uh, to, to follow the $750,000 level, um, but uh, uh, had we chosen uh, uh, to do more than uh, uh, more than this amount of work, we could have, uh, uh, we could have gone uh, a little bit higher. Um, reporting and oversight is to the city council. Again, this is, uh, 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 needs to be independent uh, of the city staff. Uh, operation, operational uh, uh, oversight uh, through the policy and services committee. Some municipalities have a separate audit committee. Um, we do not have such a committee at, that at this time. Uh, it's possible in the future, but uh, past practice this has been to do this through the policy and services committee um, and that's what we're going to continue and they will uh, do quarterly and annual progress reports and updates uh, as we had before. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so the uh, city auditor is to be uh, Kyle O'Rourke of uh, Baker Tilly who is uh, uh, will be appointed by the council per charter and municipal code. He uh, 
uh, he will get uh, a review every year uh, uh, as with no as the normal process. He meets the requirements of the city. Uh, he was interviewed twice by the city council. Uh, he, his references were outstanding and it's anticipated that, that after COVID ends, uh, he'll be on site here in Palo Alto roughly every other week. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's the second item. The third item is the uh, organization table. Um, again, uh, uh, the city council uh, directed uh, uh, the CAO committee to uh, prepare an outsource uh, of this office uh, in February of 2020 with the goal of uh, increasing auditing function, uh, cost effectiveness, uh, and, uh, and efficiency. Uh, the contract looks promising in this direction. Um, however, uh, that leaves us with uh, a redundant uh, operation. Um, and so uh, as with other outsources over the years, uh, the existing positions will be eliminated. Uh, we have, uh, as we've outsourced other city functions over the years, uh, we've had a process that we've gone through relative to the employees and uh, possible other needs within the city uh, relative to uh, severance. And the city is following uh, those policies and practices uh, in this case. Next slide, please. So uh, this took quite a while to do. And so uh, here's, here's where the time went. Uh, the outsourcing direction was in February. Um, the development of the uh, request for proposals itself uh, is actually a little bit complicated. Staff does this all the time, but this was not to be done by staff because, it's, uh, because it's, uh, independence is necessary. And so the CAO committee uh, in conjunction with a consultant uh, did it, and it took a couple of months. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the time to develop and issue the RFP uh, took most of the second quarter of the year. Uh, we did have six qualified uh, proposals uh, received uh, in uh, uh, between May and June. We actually had to uh, uh, reissue the RFP at one point to change some of the language in, in one of the clauses. And so that threw another month into the timeline. But by the beginning of July, we had six uh, qualified proposals uh, for this. And then so uh, during the months of July and August, we uh, reduced the six to four uh, and then to three and then to two. Um, the top two uh, uh, auditor candidates, we both we interviewed both of them twice uh, with the city council. Um, there was a, a fairly extensive reference checking done. Um, I should say that uh, uh, during this process, uh, you know, in my judgment, uh, you know, all six probably could have done what we're asking, but there were differences between them. Uh, it was a very difficult choice between the last two. They were both superbly qualified, and I think all of us would have liked to hire them both if we could. Uh, in fact, one of them, uh, uh, the other one is actually currently serves as the internal auditor for a number of cities around California, including one in the Bay Area. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we're not able to hire both. And uh, our judgment was uh, Baker Tilly uh, was, had the edge. Uh, and so we proceeded with, uh, with that. Uh, next slide, please. And, and Mr. O'Rourke. Baker Tilly is uh, a large nationwide uh, consulting, auditing, accounting, and professional services firm. They're actually the U.S. subsidiary of an international uh, firm. They have uh, extensive and lengthy uh, government auditing, auditing experience uh, at the city level and also state and national levels. Uh, like uh, most of the candidates, they have deep knowledge of fraud and waste, the bread and butter of, uh, of auditing, as well as public works, construction, and purchasing. Uh, a couple of thought, a couple of th areas we thought that Baker Tilly had particular depth in were utilities, uh, which we, which is a major portion of, uh, of the city's of the city's operations, and also cybersecurity, which is uh, uh, which is is changing rapidly and a major concern for cities these days. Um, you know the uh, the trade off between uh, having an internal operation versus uh, uh, going outside is an internal operation. Uh, in principle, has the possibility to know our own organization a little better than uh, than an external, at least in the early stages. Uh, Traded off against that is when you have a large firm, uh, you have the possibility that there's uh, to bring in domain experts uh, in specific areas that uh, you know a small a small city like ours doesn't have the bandwidth to to maintain internally. 
And so there's pros and cons of both models. Uh, but uh, we felt that uh, Baker Tilly had a, a very impressive uh, domain knowledge in a lot of areas, including some very, very critical ones to uh, uh, Palo Alto. Uh, throughout the, uh, th uh, as we went through the evaluation process, uh, sort of the, uh, you know, we, had, we ranked all the candidates every time we took a step through the inter evaluation process. Baker, Baker Tilly was always one of the top two. Again, it did go back and forth between the top two a little bit during the process. Again, we felt, uh, we, we felt both of them were superbly qualified. Um, the, uh, uh, the references were outstanding at, at the state and national uh, and local levels for uh, Baker Tilly and Mr. O'Rourke. So we felt comfortable with that. Um, next slide, please. So the uh, next steps going forward, uh, uh, assuming we uh, uh, execute the contract, is uh, there will be a citywide risk assessment, uh, which will lead to uh, the preparation of the audit plan. And sorry. Um, Great separation is coming. And... Uh, uh, so then there's going to be an audit plan, uh, and that is anticipated uh, in the early part of 2021 to have the audit plan ready. Um, in parallel, uh, the, uh, aud the, uh, uh, the new city auditor uh, will identify and oversee the independent financial auditor, which is kind of a separate function, and that's going to be done in the fourth quarter of this, the fourth calendar quarter this year, as well as they're going to take a uh, take over and manage the, uh, uh, the fraud and waste uh, hotline. Okay. Um, so the plan is, uh, the expectation is there will be a, a kickoff meeting in the next few days. Um, and then uh, the audit plan will go first to the policy and services committee and then the full city council uh, early in 2021. And that is, uh, and with that, I'm gonna return to the mayor. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Philseth, and really do want to acknowledge to my colleagues, to staff, and the community your hard work on this. You often use the phrase "humans work." Um, you, you've really done all of us a service in this, and thank you for leading it so much. It's, it's much appreciated. Thank you very much. I think a lot of people worked on this. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's please go to members of the public who wish to speak on this item number eleven, and then we'll come back to council. Any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone. Our first speaker is Sharon Erickson. Sharon, go ahead, you have two minutes. Good evening. Tonight, the city council is actually being asked to confirm the dismantling of the city auditor's office and the layoff of its three remaining staff members I respectfully recommend that you reject this action and direct staff to begin a new process to hire a new city auditor, an employee of the city who would be solely accountable to the city council and to the public. Palo Alto voters created the office of the city auditor in 1983 to serve as an internal watchdog over city operations. Over the years, the office has issued a series of award-winning performance audit reports with recommendations specific to Palo Alto, recommendations to improve City of Palo Alto programs and services, not cookie cutter recommendations from outside consultants. For years, the city charter has been interpreted to mean that a person would fill the position of city auditor and that there would be an office of the city auditor. Tonight, you're being asked to change that. The current employees in the city auditor's office have been notified they're being laid off. I, for one, thank them for their years of service. Such a disappointing outcome for them and for the residents of Palo Alto. And who knows what will happen to the files of the office, including typewritten financial statements from years ago. As I've said before, this is a stunningly bad idea and it should be reversed. This is not the time to reduce accountability and transparency at any level of government. As the former city auditor in both Palo Alto and San Jose, let me tell you that the accountability you get from having performance auditors on staff is not something you can outsource. So please, 
reject the agreement that's been negotiated with the outside consultant, direct the city manager to rescind the layoff notices to audit staff, and engage a recru recruiter to hire a new city auditor. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Any other members of the public that wish to speak about the city auditor contract, please raise your hand or dial star nine at this time. Mayor, fine, there's no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Erickson for your comments. Um, I see council member Niss, then vice mayor Du Bois, and I will open it up to comments, questions, and motions. So thank you, Mayor Fine. Um, Eric, I wanted to just take you over the, the bumpy road that led us here. As I recall, we started this either in 16 or 17 in what was a very difficult uh, and sort of heart, heartrending type of, of situation that we were in. And you handled it beautifully. You've kept on it. You've stayed with the program. Um, there have been more meetings than I can even count. Tens of hours have been spent on this. And I think that the end product is really going to work well, is admirable. And certainly, if anyone has been vetted, it definitely is the person that we'll consider strongly tonight. So I, I personally want to thank you for that. Uh, you and I went through parts of it together. You've gone through parts of it by yourself. You've had some um, good help, I think, from Larry Klein, among others. I was pleased that we pulled in people from the outside as well as from the inside. And um, seldom has a candidate been quite this thoroughly vetted. So again, thanks for all your time, participation, and putting together a very clear and readable um, motion that we hopefully will support tonight. And, and I'm thanks glad very much. Again, a lot, of, a lot of people worked on this and, and thank you for uh, mentioning Larry who came in and helped at the last minute as well. I think that was, you know, it was great having him involved as well. That was, that was very helpful. A lot of people did a lot, but there had to be a leader. And, and you functioned as the leader with this. And that was, that was really important. Yeah. When the time comes, I'm glad to make a motion, support the motion, whatever happens. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, first I wanna say uh, welcome to Kyle and your team. And uh, I just wondered if you wanted to take, take a minute maybe to talk about some of the people on your team. Certainly, I'd be more than willing to do that. Um, so thanks everyone for having us tonight. We're really excited about the opportunity. I think I'll have more of a comment after the vote if I'm understanding the process correctly. But uh, members of our team that are kind of key to this process, I think there's a few. Um, the first of which is Jody Dobson, who will serve as the partner in charge of this project, the, the individual signing the contract. She's critical to this for a couple of reasons, most notably that she's a utilities expert um, and Mr. Philseth mentioned the importance of utilities to Paul also in his presentation. Um, so Jody has over 20 years of audit and consulting experience with utility organizations and, and, and municipal governments. Um, additionally, we'll be supported by Heather Aker. Heather Aker has years of experience, a couple decades of experience working with governmental agencies and has recently transitioned to um, become Baker Tilly's risk and internal audit advisory service leader. Um, so she serves in, in sort of the intersection between the service and um, the, the um, industry. Um, so she'll be a key resource on this project. Um, there's a few others, I think that serve in some key areas, um, construction and risk, uh, or excuse me, construction risk management, and a gentleman named Tony Ullman will be critical to our work with the city, as well as our cybersecurity expert, Atit Shaw. Um, so those are a handful of our experts, but we look to bring the depth and breadth of, of the entire firm to bear for the city, um, which is, of course, one of the key benefits to hiring someone like us. Yeah, great. Well, again, welcome. And like, just, thanks so just, much. Yeah, just to echo, I think we went through a very thorough process. We got multiple bids. We did really extensive interviews. Um, and thanks again to Eric uh, Philseth for who managed the process. 
thank you to everybody else that was involved. Um, <clears throat> I did have one quick question. You know, you called out certain uh, meeting frequencies, but it wasn't really clear. I would expect that Kyle also participate in policy and service meetings. Is that, is that true? I don't know who can answer, maybe uh, Eric. Uh, on, uh, on, on auditing functions, yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, because it was calling out like a meeting per quarter or whatever it was, but policy and service audit items would be covered by the auditor. Is um, yes, and I would just add to that. I think the, the quarterly and annual meetings are referring to formal meetings where internal audit will present um, quarterly status updates. But in addition to that, we'll attend recurring weekly, monthly, and other key meetings. Yeah, good. Yeah, so, um, you know, looking forward to seeing how the work plan goes. I think we're talking about four major audits, two minor audits. Love to see you guys succeed expectations <laughs> and maybe we can get more than that done. Um, I also just like to take a second to thank our, our current staff for their past work. And um, so Kyle, just welcome again. I'm looking forward to working with you and your team going forward. Thanks, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'll just jump in. Um, so we really were blessed by a number of great applicants, um, but Baker Tilly, uh, Kyle, you and your firm really pulled ahead in terms of your professionalism, your expertise in local government. And as council member Phil Seth mentioned, uh, particularly in utilities. And so we're really looking forward to working with you. Um, just members of our community, Mr. O'Rourke really impressed us with his experience in local government auditing, uh, his energy, passion, and, and furthermore, his familiarity with the Palta community and the challenges and opportunities that exist here as an auditor. So we're, we're definitely looking forward to working with you and your team. Um, one other thing I'll mention that we, we've, I guess, mentioned to each other is this, this new format will require closer collaboration between the city council um, and your team, Mr. O'Rourke. And I think that's a real opportunity for us to sync up in terms of what audits are being done, what the expectations are, what the cost should be, uh, what the outcome should look like, and then how do we pass the, those audits on to other city departments to actually to make changes uh, to make our city uh, better and safer. So I look forward, as the vice mayor said, to seeing the audit plan um, but it's on each of us and future councils to really work with you hand in hand to make, make sure there's a successful partnership. Councilmember Cormack. I don't have anything new to add, but I want to emphasize a few of the points that my colleagues have made. Um, and uh, I'll start with what Councilmember Philseth said at the beginning. We are on track to get a little bit more, a few more audits each year at a little bit lower cost. And I think that that's the objective we've had from the beginning. Um, after reviewing uh, how we were doing it compared to, to other cities. Um, Council member Phil Seth's diligence in going through this process has been legendary and is certainly very much appreciated. It's always a pleasure to work with him um, on, this, on this sort of thing. And um, I was pleased to be part of the Council Appointed Officers Committee. And I'll tell you, we didn't do much else in July besides this. <laughs> um, uh, I also second the comments about the um, breadth of expertise um, that Baker Tilly um, brings, uh, particularly with respect to public works and construction and utilities. We just can't emphasize that enough. It's a very large part of the business that we do here um, and a real opportunity for us. And then I wanna echo uh, what Mayor Fine was saying about the work that the council has ahead of us. I wanna thank the vice mayor for thanking our employees um, who have served and um, will be um, and whose positions are no longer um, going to be available. Um, and second is welcome of Mr. O'Rourke, um, who I'm confident will be a positive addition to our team. Thanks, Council Member Cormack. Um, Council Member Ku. Thank you. So welcome, Mr. O'Rourke. And I just want to thank the team, including uh, Council Member Phil Seth, and Mr. Larson and Gonda, I know that you led this effort. So thank you for that too, as well as to Council Member Cormack and to Council Member Niss. Um, I just wanted to ask, we received a letter uh, today from, um, from another auditor about, geez, I have to find it here. <clears throat> Sorry, give me a second to get it up. 
from the association. This is the of yeah government. association of local government auditors. Thank you, um, Mayor. So um, it basically said that um, it's not necessary for you to be a member of the association of local government auditors, is it? And what is the purpose of being a member of that? Mr. Um, so, Larson? Yes, thank you very much for the question. And I think the, the question has a couple components. The first of which is related to my membership or our membership and when it expired. I think we've since rectified that um, and a little bit of confusion about that, but we've rectified that matter. Um, regarding the um, the audit requirement or the peer review requirement, um, you know, there's a the question as to whether or not we need to be a member, whether we qualify as being a member, you know, as an outside firm. I think we have a couple of different options to rectify that. Um, the first of which would be to, um, you know, engage via the city of Palo Alto versus Baker Tilly. Um, alternatively, um, we could, you know, engage a third party that is not the ALGA to audit against the same exact standards. Um, so I'm very confident that we'll achieve the achieve what we've outlined within the RF, uh, within our proposal and what you've requested within the RFP. Um, we might have to get slightly creative, um, but very confident that we'll achieve it. Very good. Well, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Um, Council Member Niss and then Tanaka. So, um, although it certainly would be Eric's purview if he wishes to do it, but if not, I'm glad to move item number 11, which is to approve the contract with Baker Tilly LLP for internal auditor services and the amount not to exceed 1.3 million for a term commencing October 1 through June 30th of 2022, including approval of four initial task orders, adoption of a resolution to appoint Kyle O'Rourke or Baker Tilly as city auditor and amendment of the table of organization to eliminate four positions in various funds. So, Thank Hold you for a second. Council Member Ness. Um, that is the Count CAO recommendation. Uh, is there a second for that? I'll second. Council Member, okay. okay. Council Member. I, I, can't uh, see, I can't see Council Member Phil Seth. He shook his head <laughs> earlier. No worries. We, he's we he's all not on mute. This. Okay. Um, Council Member Ness moved the motion, second by Council Member Cormack. Uh, Council Member Ness, do you wish to speak to your motion? I, I I think this has been one of the longer processes I've ever gone through. So it's a pleasure to move it and I welcome Kyle. We're going to see him, I'm sure, a fair amount um, and looking forward to a, a, a wonderful new way to provide audits in the city of Palo Alto. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cormack. I don't have anything to add to our collective earlier comments. Okay, um, I see a hand from Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, um, just wanted to just join in thanking all the folks. So the CAO, awesome job, thank you. Uh, thank you also to the, um, the current auditor's office and all the employees in there. Really appreciate your guys' work and service. And just wanna welcome the new team. I look forward to the vote. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to suggest we vote and moving down our alphabetical order. Uh, Council Member Niss. Yes. Council Member Ku. Yes. Council Member Tanaka. Yes. Council Member Cormack. Yes. Vice Mayor Du Bois. Yeah. Hear me? Yep. Uh, Council Member Philseth. Yes. Council and I'm a yes. Um, so that motion passes on a seven to zero vote. If we are in council chambers, I think we would normally all give you a small round of applause, Mr. O'Rourke. So if you all want to take your mute off and welcome to the city of Palo Alto. Um, we're really happy and proud to appoint you as our auditor and hire your firm. So congratulations, Mr. O'Rourke. Thank um, you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, 
and would like to echo the, the thanks that you all gave to the many members involved in the process. Um, it's been excellent. And if all, if all my clients were, you know, ran a process this smooth and in depth, I would, I would love it. So very much looking forward to working with all of you. Great. Um, I want to turn it over to you. If there's anything else um, you want to share with the council, the community, um, any other thoughts or questions or ideas uh, that, that are on your mind? Certainly. Um, I, I think I'd like to start off again by saying thanks to everyone in the process, involved in the process. Um, I'm very humbled and honored um, for the opportunity to serve in this position and very excited for what's to come in our work together. Um, you've heard a lot about our firm, um, you know, the size, depth, and breadth of the services we offer. I think that's going to be key to the success of the project um, and probably a large reason why we were selected. Um, in terms of introducing myself, I think you know, for folks that are very interested, you can pen through the um, council agenda and learn a little bit more about my background. Um, you'll see that I check the, all the boxes, so to speak, that are required um, within the RFP and within um, the city code. Um, but beyond that, I'm very dedicated to the internal audit profession. I'm very involved in, in my local chapter and as well as, as a at the national level. Um, and I'm also very dedicated to public service. And there's a reason that I work um, exclusively with public sector entities, despite working at a private company. Um, it's what I love. It's what I very much enjoy doing. And it's what I've done for a number of years. So very excited to put those two passions together and serve the city of Palo Alto. Um, as was noted by Mr. Phil Seth, we'll be getting started here in just a few days, beginning with our citywide risk assessment. Um, for those of the, of the City staff who might be listening, who I've not yet met, very much enjoy, um, uh, very much am excited about getting to know all of you. Um, you'll be in risk interviews um, here very shortly and, and look forward to uh, uh, chatting with you soon. Um, and for, you know, anybody else who's listening who, you know, might have input for the city auditor, um, the city audit auditor's email address, which is available online, is certainly active. Um, I will be connected to it here very shortly. Um, and if there's a conversation we need to engage in around risk and internal audit, um, I, I look forward to, to doing so. So thanks so much to everyone on the line and everyone who helped out in this process. We look forward to serving you. Thank you. Congratulations again. Um, I see a hand from council member Phil Seth. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I wanted to, to, to thank one more group and give a shout out to management partners here who was invaluable in this process. Uh, I see Greg Larson's on the on the on the call, Greg actually had a root canal this morning, which uh, hopefully was uh, was was more painful than the process that we went through to do this. So anyway, you, you and Pete and so forth, we couldn't have done it without you guys. So thank you, thank you guys too, and thank everybody else. Yikes! Well, thank you. Um, I think with that, we are going to wrap up this item number eleven. Mr. O'Rourke, again, congratulations. We're glad to have you. Um, and before we go to item one, I'm going to suggest we do council member questions, comments, and announcements, uh, then move back to item number one, our closed session, and then we'll adjourn in that closed session. Um, so as for council member comments, questions, and announcements, just, just one really quick one. Um, some of you may have heard, Greg, you may have seen in the College Terrace newsletter, um, last week Palo Alto lost a, a really important citizen and contributor. Uh, Patricia June Lacey Robinson, also known as Pat Robinson. Um, she was one of my neighbors in College Terrace, one of my teachers at Ohlone, um, spent 35 plus years teaching kindergarten at Ohlone and many Palo Alto kids, uh, including myself, are much better off for her. Um, there was a small gathering um, last week in her memory for her family and uh, we will all miss her. So just wanted to announce that. If you have something to share or questions, please uh, hit your hand. Council Member Koo. Um, Mayor, uh, could you also put on one of your tasks to recognize that September 15th to October 15th is uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month? I would be happy to recognize that. Thank uh, you. Absolutely, thank you for the reminder. Any other comments from my colleagues? Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a five minute break, which means we probably uh, drag it out till 1030 and then reconvene uh, for our closed session. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to all of our members of the public for joining. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we will adjourn our meeting in closed session and I, I will report out the time to the uh, city clerk. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>